of a sin and unholiness were immersed in them. But don't let that lead you away from the source of truth. My job as a priest to tell you, keep away from false aberrations. Keep away from the errors of the fundamentalists. Do not read anything about the rapture, the millennium, the thousand-year reign. Do not read the Schofield Reference Bible. Do not read any Seventh-day Adventist literature. Do not read any Hal Lindsey books, such as the late great planet Earth, Satan is alive and well and living on Earth, or what have you. Do not read the Left Behind books. Do not go to the Left Behind movies. Do not listen to dispensational preachers or other TV and radio preachers. And if you have any of this kind of stuff at home, use it in your wood stove. If you don't have a wood stove, throw it in the garbage. That's where it belongs. Number two, obviously the end of the world is an exciting and a frightening topic to say the least. But before anybody gets excited, remember we always have to keep in mind God knows everything. He knows from all eternity exactly when he was going to have every person live. He knows exactly what he's doing, and no matter when he chose to have someone live, he gives that person all the graces they need to become a saint at that exact time in the history of the world. We need to remember that the most important thing is not when in history we live, but how we die. The most important thing, the very most important thing, is to die in the state of grace. Okay, that's the one thing that finally really matters. Third point, the church teaches that prophecy is only completely understood in its fulfillment. What does that mean? It means that in general, all the parts of the prophecy are not completely clear until after the events have come to pass, and then men can look back and say, oh yeah, that makes total sense. But given that God gives us prophecy to help guide us, and nowadays there are so many confusing and wrong ideas floating about, especially about the end time prophecies, how is it that we're supposed to stay on the right track? Look, our Lord knew we'd have problems and confusion, so he established a teaching church and sent down the Holy Spirit to guide it, as he promised, to the end of the world. And God, who disposes all things sweetly, has periodically raised up extraordinary teachers to guide us. There are 33 of them in total. These teachers are renowned for their holiness of life, the importance and orthodoxy of their writings, and they've been officially recognized as a church as doctors. That means that they're officially approved teachers of the faith. So they're safe guides to lead us through these thorny theological thickets. Thickets like the end time prophecies. So to stay inside the boundaries, besides a brief introduction taken from the work of the great Dr. St. Augustine, today we'll rely almost completely on the work of one doctor. A great Jesuit with a photographic memory, St. Robert Bellarmine, who summarized the teachings of the fathers and doctors with respect especially to one extremely foreboding aspect of the end times. He wrote a whole book about that menacing man, the man of sin, the Antichrist. We'll rely on that work today, but believe me, we're only going to skim over the surface of what Cardinal Bellarmine wrote about. Now all that is by way of introduction. According to the teachings of the fathers, just as a week has six days followed by a day of rest, so also the history of the world has six ages followed by the eternal heavenly rest of the saints. In his work on the catechizing of the uninstructed, St. Augustine gives a brief summary of the teaching of the fathers with respect to these six ages of the world. As he points out, the first age of the world went from Adam until Noah. The second age of the world began at the ending of the Great Flood until Abraham, who was, as St. Augustine notes, the father of all nations which follow his example of faith, but from his own flesh he was the father of the Jews. 
who are the one people among all the nations that worship the true God. The third age of the world extends from Abraham to King David. The fourth age of the world from King David to the Babylonian captivity. The fifth age of the world from the Babylonian captivity to the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. And with the coming of our Lord, we're now in the sixth and final age of the world, which will last until our Lord's second coming on the last day, Judgment Day. So again, the history of the world in a nutshell. The first age, Adam to the flood. The second age, the flood to Abraham. The third age, Abraham to King David. The fourth age, King David to the Babylonian captivity. The fifth age, the Babylonian captivity to Christ's coming. The sixth age, first Christmas to last judgment. And then that's the end of time. Now the sixth age of the world has two basic divisions. And understand them, we have to keep firmly in mind that before Christ our Lord came, only the Jews had the true religion. Only the Jews worshipped the true God. Only the Jews had the true priesthood. Only the Jews had the sacrifice demanded by God. Only the Jews had the true temple, which was in Jerusalem, okay? Only the Jews knew the true God, and only the Jews worshipped the true God. And only the Jews knew the true faith, no one else. So if no one else knew the true God, who were our ancestors worshiping for those of us that are not descended from the Jews? The inspired word of God gives the answer in Psalm 95, 5, where it states, All the gods of the Gentiles are devils. Now the prophets pointed out that during the first part of the sixth age of the world, the messianic age in which we live, the pagan nations would give up this devil worship and come to worship the true God. The pagan nations would give up their paganism and become Catholic. But then during the second part of the sixth stage of the world, according to prophecy, the Gentiles will reject the true God and turn back to paganism. So there's two basic divisions in the sixth stage of the world, the coming in of the Gentiles and the going out of the Gentiles. Now, before we get into any more details, we might wonder where we are in the sixth stage of the world. Are we in the first part with the pagan nations leaving idolatry and worshiping the true God? Or are we in the second part with the Gentile nations leaving the worship of the true God, that is, rejecting Catholicism, and turning back to paganism? To ask this question is to answer it. Another word for the second part of the sixth age of the world is the end times. What are the signs of the end times? St. Robert Bellarmine gives six absolutely certain signs besides the coming of the Antichrist himself. Two of these signs precede the Antichrist, two accompany him, and two follow upon his rule. First we'll look at this list, and then we'll take a closer look at these signs as well as the man of sin. The six signs, according to St. Robert Bellarmine. The two signs which precede the Antichrist, the gospel must be preached in the whole world. The Roman Empire's power must be terminated. The two signs which accompany the Antichrist, the preaching of Enoch and Elias, or Elijah, the savage persecution, and the ending of all public mass. The two signs which follow upon the rule of the Antichrist, the destruction of the Antichrist, and the end of the world. Now let's begin by taking a closer look at the sign. Two signs which precede the Antichrist. The first sign that gospel must be preached in the whole world. We'll just note in passing what Christ the Lord said and move past that. Matthew 24:14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then shall the consummation come. Second of the signs that precede the Antichrist. The Roman Empire must be terminated. What is that supposed to mean? Hasn't the Roman Empire been gone for about a zillion years? Well, this is a perfect example of why we need tradition. This is a certain conclusion based in Holy Scripture but we can only understand it from tradition. 
First, we'll look at where the idea of the termination of Roman power comes from. Then we'll take a look at what precisely it means insofar as we can see that. Cardinal Bellarmine here is summarizing the teaching of the fathers with respect to Daniel's the book of prophet Daniel chapter 2 and 7, the Apocalypse chapter 17, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're not going to go into any detail for the sake of time. We'll take a look at that mysterious passage referring to the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I will read a shortened version. Quote, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you be not easily terrified, as if the Lord, day of the Lord were at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for there must first come a revolt for the man of sin to be revealed, the son of perdition. Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth, that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity already worketh, only he who now holdeth do hold until he be taken out of the way. Close quote the Holy Spirit. There must first come a revolt for the man of sin to be revealed. You know what withholdeth. He who now holdeth do hold to be taken out of the way. What does that mean? There's actually two aspects to this, one religious and one political. The revolt that must come first is the religious aspect. It's also known as the great apostasy, which is the massive turning away of Gentile peoples from the true faith, abandoning Catholicism, and turning back to paganism. That's the religious aspect of what St. Paul is saying here. The political aspect is this mysterious something which is withholding the advent of the Antichrist. What is it? The fathers tell us it's the power of the Roman Empire which is blocking the coming. So what does that mean? It would be a topic of sermons, or sermons just to cover this one topic, so we'll take a look at three points from the fathers, and we'll tie them together. First, just in passing, we note in the book of the prophet Daniel, Daniel sees a vision in chapter 7, and in it he sees a beast with ten horns, and then there's a little horn that rises up. You can read more about that at home. First point, St. Jerome, doctor of the church, comments on this vision. Quote, We must say what has been handed down to us by all ecclesiastical writers, that in the end of the world, when the Roman Empire is to be destroyed, there will be ten kings to divide the Roman territory between them, and an eleventh will rise up, a small king, who will subdue three of the ten, and thereupon receive the submission of the other seven. Close quote, St. Jerome. The small king is the Antichrist. So the first point is that all the fathers state at the end of the world there will be ten kings of that Roman territory, and the Antichrist will rise up and destroy the Roman Empire. Second point. St. Hippolytus of Rome explicitly states that the ten states which will appear, all other kingdoms and ruled by kings, shall also be democracies. Third point. Cardinal Bellarmine quotes Lactantius, who explains exactly what the final destruction of the Roman Empire means. Quote, The Roman power which now rules the world, and my mind shudders with fright to say, but I am speaking of things in the future, shall be taken from the earth, and the power to rule shall return to Asia, and once again the Orient shall dominate, and the West shall serve. Close quote. Let's tie all these points together. What are the fathers saying here? They're saying that the Antichrist is being restrained from seizing power by the Roman Empire, which has to be understood prophetically as being the remaining areas of the empire which remain under Western rule. The Roman Empire will last until the great apostasy, a rejection of the true faith by the Gentile nations. During this time, there will be ten kings ruling ten democracies in what used to be the Roman Empire, and then an eleventh king will rise up, subdue three of those ten kings, and other seven will submit to him. The power of the Roman Empire will disappear once the West is subject to the East, and the power shifts over to Asia. We will soon see that the Fathers located the precise location in Asia to which this dominion will be shifted. That's the gist of this prophecy, which basically leaves us in a more luminous darkness. 
Remember that prophecy is only understood completely in its fulfillment. Those are the two signs which precede the Antichrist. Next week, we'll begin examining the two signs that will accompany him and so forth. But before we do that, we'll take an extremely brief look at the, what St. Robert has summarized about the man of sin, the Antichrist. St. Robert says the Antichrist is one man, according to Scripture and all the fathers. He states that there are two most certain facts about him. He is principally coming for the Jews and will be received by them as the Messiah. Secondly, he will be born of Jewish stock and circumcised and observe the Sabbath at least for a time. As our Lord stated to the Jews, You have rejected me, but another will come in his own name, and him you will not reject. St. Robert also points out a fearful symmetry. Just as Christ first came to the Jews, to whom he was promised, and by whom he was expected, and then later he joined the Gentiles to himself, so also the Antichrist will first come to the Jews, by whom he is expected, and then later, one after another, he will subject all the Gentile nations to himself. St. Robert points out that the Antichrist is not the devil incarnate. Only God can take on another nature. The devil has an angelic nature, so he can't become incarnate. He can only possess a man. St. Robert says, quote, He will be the most perfect instrument of the devil, so that in him is the bodily expression of all possible diabolical malice, just as in Christ our Lord was the bodily expression of all divine goodness. Close quote, St. Robert. In the terms of his name, we all know that the number of his name is 666. St. Robert quotes St. Irenaeus, the father of the church, at great length on this point. St. Irenaeus was taught by St. Polycarp, and St. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. In sum, his name is a secret kept by God until the Antichrist arrives, since he isn't worthy to have his name pre-announced by heaven. St. John the Apostle explicitly warned that no one should attempt to guess this name from the number. Why? Because those who do this will be easily deceived by him when he arrives under his own name, since they will not be on their guard against him. As to the seat of the Antichrist, where will he rule? St. Paul wrote that the Antichrist would take his seat in the temple of God, claiming himself to be God. What is meant here? St. Robert Bellarmine gives two possibilities. First, Rome. As that great doctor, St. Jerome, states, quote, He shall sit in the temple of God, either Jerusalem, as some think, or in the church, as is more truly thought. Close quote. For Ecumenius, who stated, quote, He did not sit in the temple of Jerusalem, but the church of Christ. Close quote. Other choice. Jerusalem. St. Robert states, quote, Nevertheless, the true opinion is that the Antichrist shall rule from Jerusalem, not from Rome, from the temple of Solomon and the throne of David, not the temple of St. Peter and the apostolic see. Close quote St. Robert. St. Robert supports his argument using both scripture and tradition, showing that this is by far the more common teaching of the fathers, even showing that elsewhere St. Jerome has written of Antichrist being in Jerusalem. He adds an interesting detail to that discussion of Lactantius we've already seen. Remember that during the time of the Antichrist, the supreme rule will pass over to Asia and the Orient will dominate while the West is in servitude. St. Robert completes this thought, showing that Lactantius clearly states which part of Asia this king shall rule. And that's Syria. Now remember, this is the ancient Latin terminology. He even tells the part of Syria that this man will rule from. Judea. St. Robert also discusses the doctrines of the Antichrist. He points out there are four major principles here. First, he will deny that Jesus is the Christ. Therefore, he will attack everything our Savior instituted, such as baptism, confirmation, the priesthood, etc. He shall teach that the Jewish laws, such as circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, and those ancient ceremonies have not ceased, but still have force. Second, he will assert himself to be the true Christ promised in the law and prophets. Another will come in his own name. 
Third, he will promise him, proclaim himself to be God, and he will wish to be worshipped as God. Finally, he will proclaim that not only is he God, but he's also the only God, and he will attack all other gods, both the true God and all false gods, even idols. Okay, next week we'll finish our brief look at the man of sin, and we'll pick up where we left off with the six absolutely certain signs of the end of the world. Let's review. We've seen the history of the world can be broken into six ages. The first age, Adam to the flood. Second age, flood to Abraham. Third age, Abraham to King David. Fourth age, King David to Babylonian captivity. Fifth age, Babylonian King Christmas. Sixth age, from Christmas, the first Christmas, to the second coming, and it's the end of time. We've seen there's two basic divisions in the sixth age of the world. The Gentiles coming into the Catholic Church, the Gentiles going back out of the Catholic Church. We've seen there six absolutely certain signs of the end of the world. Two signs which precede the Antichrist. The gospel must be preached to the whole world. And the power of the Roman Empire must be terminated. The two signs which will accompany that will be preaching. And there will be a savage persecution and the ending of all public mass. Two signs which follow upon the rule of Antichrist. His destruction and end of the world. We took a brief look at the meaning of the end of the Roman Empire and saw it meant that until the end of the world, the Antichrist will be stained from seizing power by the presence of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire will last in some sense until the great apostasy, which is a rejection of the true faith by the Gentile nations. During this time, there will be ten kings ruling ten democracies in what used to be the Roman Empire. An eleventh king will rise up, subdue three of the ten kings, and the other seven will submit to him. The power of the Roman Empire will disappear once the West is subject to the East, and the power will shift to Asia, specifically to Jerusalem. We've taken a closer look at this foreboding man, the son of perdition. He'll be Jewish, and observe the Jewish laws, at least for a while. He will not be the devil incarnate, but he will be possessed in the most perfect bodily instrument of Satan. Although the number of his name is 666, we are explicitly forbidden from guessing who he might be using this number in order to avoid winding up as one of his followers. He will rule the world from Jerusalem. He will deny that Jesus is the Christ and institute Jewish laws. He will proclaim himself to be Christ and God, to demand to be worshipped as such, and will attack all other gods, even the true God. Why am I preaching on all this? In the first place, it's the end of the liturgical year, and so the church, your infinite wisdom, has placed this topic before us. It's part of our faith, so it's my duty to teach it to you. We're not studying this to be sensational. We live in a time when there's so much radical nonsense on this very notion spewing out of every kind of media outlet that we have to look at it in slightly more depth than we might otherwise do. During the offertory today, place yourself on the host and in the wine and make a special intention to grow in holiness and to keep the holy faith in the time of this apostasy. Last week, we took a brief look at the six ages of the world according to the Fathers, and then the six absolutely certain signs of the end of the world according to St. Robert Bellarmine, Doctor of the Church, and then we took a brief look at that most menacing of men, the Antichrist. And a few points again, remember that the most important thing is not when in history that we live, but how we die. The most important thing, the very most important thing, is to die in the state of grace. That's the purpose of the Catholic Church, is to help you have a holy death. Second point, throw out any of these rapture books, anything by Hal Lindsey, any left behind, any of that kind of trash, get rid of it, put it in the wood stove. Third point, if some of the things we talk about seem difficult to understand, there's a reason for that. It is difficult to understand. The church teaches that prophecy is only completely understood in its fulfillment. Therefore, for safe guidance, we're sticking very closely to St. Robert Bellarmine, doctor of the church. And although we're greatly abbreviating his book, which would run upwards of 100 pages if it was put in modern typesetting and translated. So basically what I'm doing for you here is a book report that's woven out of quotes and paraphrases of St. Bellarmine's work, Robert Bellarmine's work on the Antichrist. And I'm refraining from adding my own opinions. The one unavoidable influence that I'm having is that I can only select a certain amount of material to discuss. 
Therefore, I selected those six points that St. Robert emphasizes as being absolutely certain as the outline for these two sermons. And then within those categories in his discussions, I tried to select the explanations and comments that St. Robert states are the most certain from the teaching of the fathers. Again, the reason we're spending so much time on this is not simply because the church places this before our eyes two Sundays in a row, but also because there's so many crazy ideas floating around, and I hear them regularly from the lips of Catholics that ought to know better. So this is sort of a let's substitute truth for lies uh, series. Okay, quick review. We saw the history of the world can be broken into six ages. The first age is Adam to the flood. The second age, the flood to Abraham. The third age, Abraham to King David. The fourth age, King David to the Babylonian captivity. The fifth age, the Babylonian captivity until the birth of Christ our Lord. And the sixth and final age of the world lasts from the first Christmas to the last judgment. And then it's the end of time. We saw that there are two basic divisions in the sixth age of the world. The Gentiles coming into the Catholic Church, the Gentiles going back out of the Catholic Church. We saw that there are six absolutely certain signs of the end of the, end of the world. Two signs which precede the Antichrist are the gospel must be preached in the whole world, uh, the Roman Empire must be terminated. The two signs which accompany the Antichrist, the preaching of Enoch and Elias, also known as Elijah, with savage persecution and ending of all public masses. And then the two signs which follow upon the rule of the Antichrist are his destruction and the end of the world. We took a brief look at the first two signs and more of a time at the ter meaning of the termination of the Roman Empire and saw, in sum, it means that until the end of the world, the Antichrist will be restrained from seizing power by the power of the Roman Empire in some sense. The Roman Empire will last in some sense until the great apostasy, which is a rejection of the true faith by the Gentile nations. And during this time, there will be ten kings ruling ten democracies in what used to be the Roman Empire. The eleventh king will rise up, subdue three of the ten kings, and another seven will submit to him. The power of the Roman Empire will disappear once the West is subject to the East. The power will shift to Asia, specifically to Jerusalem. We took a quick look at the Antichrist. He'll be Jewish and observe the Jewish laws, at least for some time. He will not be the devil incarnate, but he will be possessed in the most perfect bodily instrument of Satan. Although the number of his name is 666, we're explicitly forbidden from guessing who he might be using this number in order to avoid winding up as one of his followers. He will rule the world from Jerusalem. He will deny that Jesus is the Christ and institute Jewish laws. He will proclaim himself to be Christ and God and will demand to be worshipped as such and will attack all other gods, even the true God. So that's where we left off last week. Now we'll continue by looking at one more ugly feature of the man of sin, and then we'll continue with more of the certain signs of the end times. So the Antichrist continued. St. Robert points out that it's clearly taught in both Scripture, the 24th chapter of St. Matthew, the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse, and the 2nd chapter of 2 Thessalonians, as well as in tradition that the Antichrist will possess quasi-miraculous powers of satanic origin. In other words, he will be able to perform many marvels which appear to be miraculous. He will appear to be able to raise the dead and heal the sick. These will be demonic illusions, not true healings. All his marvels will have natural causes, but these causes will be hidden from men. For example, in the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse, the dragon gives his power and throne and great authority to the beast. Then one of the heads of the beast has a mortal wound, but this wound is healed, which makes the whole earth follow the beast with wonder. So one of the heads of the beast has this mortal wound, the wound's healed, the whole earth follows the beast with wonder. St. Robert explains this passage about the beast's head having a mortal wound, which is then healed. Quote, Nearly all the ancient fathers explain this of the Antichrist himself, who will fake his own death, and then by diabolical powers raise himself up again, so that he might imitate the true death and resurrection of Christ, and by this means seduce many. Close quote. All the fathers, all of them, teach that the Antichrist will be the most incredible magician. He'll be possessed by the devil from his very conception, or at least his infancy, 
and he will be able to perform all his marvels by satanic power. St. Cyril states the Antichrist will be the most very highly instructed magician, learned in witchcraft, spells, and the black arts. And his marvels are called lying wonders because they are performed by the father of lies. So we've seen a few more details about the Antichrist. He'll be possessed, at least since his infancy. He'll be learned in all the occult arts, sorcery, incantations, and so forth. Because of his incredible powers of satanic origin, he'll be able to perform things which appear to be true miracles to men. Why will the Antichrist perform these miracles? St. Robert notes that the purpose of all these wonders will be so that he can prove that he's God just as Christ our Lord did true miracles to demonstrate his divinity. So the Antichrist will do these miracles so he can convince everybody he's the Christ, so he can convince everybody that he's God. Okay, now let's pick up again with the absolutely certain signs. First, the two signs which will accompany the Antichrist. First one, the preaching of Enoch and Elias, and the second one, the persecution. The preaching of Enoch and Elias. Enoch is a great-grandpa of Noah. You can look that up in Genesis 5, and he was taken up. That means all of us are descended from Enoch. Elias, or Elijah, is the prophet who, as we all know, was taken up in the chariot of fire. Neither of them have died yet. St. Robert points out that Scripture proves these two prophets will live and will return. They will return to preach against the Antichrist. Enoch will preach principally to the Gentiles, and Elias principally to the Jews. They will both preach and perform miracles, convincing many to reject the Antichrist and to turn back to the Holy Faith. St. Robert states that it is heresy, or proximate to heresy, to deny that the two witnesses in the Apocalypse are Enoch and Elias. Thanks to Elias' preaching, the Jews will largely convert. St. Robert, quote, Enoch and Elias will come again. They are still alive. The reason they are still living is that they will oppose Antichrist when he comes, and they will conserve the elect in the faith of Christ, and indeed they will convert the Jews. And this is obvious from the words, and he shall restore all things. For to restore all things means to call all Jews and heretics, and perhaps many Catholics who have been deceived by the Antichrist, to the true faith. Close quote, St. Robert Darman. After their preaching, Enoch and Elias will be killed, and they'll lay on the streets of Jerusalem for three days, while the forces of evil have what amounts to a satanic glee party. Then, to the horror of the followers of the Antichrist, they will both be resurrected and assumed into heaven. That's what St. John is referring to in the 11th chapter of the Apocalypse. Now, I'll read a shortened version that I've edited just for the sake of this. Apocalypse 11, 3 and following. And I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. When they have finished their testimony, the beast shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and shall kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, where our Lord also was crucified. And the nations shall see their bodies for three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their bodies to be laid in sepulchres. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelled upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and a great fear fell upon all them that saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Close quote, the Holy Spirit. Remember again, St. Robert says it's heresy or proximate to heresy to deny these two witnesses are Enoch and Elias. So, summing that up, Enoch and Elias are still alive. They're coming back during the reign of Antichrist to pose him with preaching and miracles to convert the Jews who will finally become Catholics. Also to convert heretics and Catholics who have been duped by the Antichrist. They'll be killed, they'll lay out in the streets of Jerusalem. After three days, they'll be raised from the dead and assumed into heaven. Now the persecution. St. Robert, quote, Absolutely all the evil men together shall be in the army of the Antichrist and shall with open authority attack all the saints of the church. For nowadays there are many men who pretend to be in the church, who conceal their mouths, but their hearts are outside the church, although their bodies are inside. But then they shall all break out, says St. Augustine, in open persecution from their hidden hatred. 
close quote. How vicious will this persecution be? St. Augustine says that during the time of the Antichrist, the devil shall be loosed, and therefore the persecution will be that much greater than all the preceding persecutions in history. For this persecution, occurring while the final judgment is imminent, shall be the last which will be endured by the Holy Church throughout the world. The whole city of Christ being assailed by the whole city of the devil as each exists on earth. St. Hippolytus and St. Cyril say that the martyrs killed by the Antichrist will be more glorious than all the preceding martyrs because all the martyrs before the time of the Antichrist had to battle against human ministers of the devil, but these last martyrs shall have to fight against the raging devil himself. St. Robert makes three points concerning this battle. He's commenting on the 20th chapter of the Apocalypse, which speaks of the battle of Gog and Magog upon the stains. His three points. One, the battle of Gog and Magog is actually the battle of the Antichrist against the Church, the very last persecution which the Antichrist will raise up against the Church all over the whole world. Two, it is very probable that Gog signifies the Antichrist himself, and Magog signifies his army. Three, the Antichrist's army, Magog, has this strange name because of the people who are in the army. This is a very interesting point. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 10, there's a list of the descendants of Noah after they pop when they populate the world after the flood. This list is also known as the Table of Nations. Well, so what? What does this have to do with the army of the Antichrist? Everything. See, the name Magog is found there. And St. Robert thinks that the greater part of the army of the Antichrist will either be made up of barbarians arising from the land of Magog, or else he thinks the army will be extremely brutal and cruel because the men descended from Magog are proverbially noted for being savage. So the army of the Antichrist will be made up of savage men from Magog, and what is that supposed to mean? Magog is the father of a people traditionally known as the Scythians. Scythia, the homeland of Scythians, is an ancient term for a region of Europe and Asia north of the Black and Caspian Seas and stretching eastward from the Danube River to China. And what do we call that nowadays? Russia and its satellite nations in Central Asia. In other words, St. Robert thinks that the greater part of the army of the Antichrist will either be made up of savage men from Russia and surrounding Central Asian countries, in fact, even less some, or of men whose cruelty will be on the same scale. As for the ending of public mass, quote, the persecution of the Antichrist will be the most severe and the most notorious, so that all public religious ceremonies and sacrifices will cease, close quote, St. Robert. He continues, quote, In the time of the Antichrist, because of the horrible persecution, the public and daily office and sacrifice of the church will cease, as Daniel clearly teaches in chapter 12, verse 11. And from when the time the continual sacrifice shall be taken away, thus shall be 1,290 days. The consensus of all the fathers is that in this place Daniel is speaking of the time of the Antichrist. And what this passage means that the Antichrist will prohibit all divine worship, which is now practiced in the Church of Christ, and most especially who prohibit the most holy sacrifice of the Mass. Close quote, Cardinal Bellarmine. The Antichrist will prohibit all divine worship, which is now practiced in the Church of Christ, and most especially who will prohibit the most holy sacrifice of the Mass. So the persecution of the Antichrist will be the last persecution in the world, and savage beyond all previous persecutions. I will make a parenthetical observation. In case we might wonder why this is going to be so savage, it's because purgatory ends on Judgment Day. What does that mean? It means that all the saints at the end of the world have to get their purgatory time done before death. And that is why God will allow the Antichrist to be so savage to these people. That's the end of my parenthetical remarks. At any rate, the army of the Antichrist will be made up largely of men from Russia and the surrounding Central Asian countries, or of men whose cruelty will be comparable to them. The tax will be so violent that all public ceremonies of the Catholic Church, including the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, will cease. We'll end today by looking at one of the two signs which fall on the rule of the Antichrist, his destruction.
St. Robert teaches that the length of time the Antichrist will rule the world is clear from chapters 7 and 12 of the book of the prophet Daniel and chapters 11, 12, and 13 from the book of the Apocalypse. The Antichrist will rule the world for three and a half years. He explains why the time of the witnesses, the two witnesses, Enoch and Elias, are 1260 days while the time of the Antichrist is 1290 days. The Antichrist rule will be a month longer since he will rule for that much longer after he kills Enoch and Elias. St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Gregory the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas say that at this time the Antichrist will go to Mount Olivet. Then, in a totally blasphemous imitation of our Lord's ascension into heaven, the Antichrist, by the power of Satan, will ascend into the air, pretending that he's returning to heaven. So be lifted up by the power of demons, and everybody will be admiring him as he rises up and acclaiming him as God. But then suddenly, by the order of Christ our Lord, St. Michael will knock him out of the air. He'll fall to earth, which will swallow him up, just as it did the men who rebelled against Moses, and he'll fall down into hell. And of the Antichrist. <clears throat> the fathers teach that about a month and a half after the death of the Antichrist, our Lord will come in judgment. That's a topic for another day, maybe next year sometime. Okay, let's review. Today we looked at one more particularly horrible feature, the Antichrist. That he'll be a master of the black arts, a sorcerer like none that's ever lived, consecrated to Satan and possessed by him from his conception or infancy, raised up and tutored and skilled in all the satanic arts of magic, incantations, witchcraft, and such. He'll have these apparently miraculous powers of satanic origin, all which are lies, but which include the ability to apparently heal the sick and even raise the dead. He'll even apparently raise himself from the dead. And he performs all these marvels with one goal in mind, to convince everyone that he's the Christ and that he is God. We took a look at three more of the absolutely certain signs of the end of the world, the two signs which accompany the Antichrist, which are the preaching of the two witnesses, Enoch and Elias, the Antichrist's persecution and his destruction. We saw that Enoch and Elias are still alive, that they're coming back during the reign of the Antichrist to pose him with preaching miracles to convert the Jews who will finally become Catholics, also to convert the Catholics and the heretics who have been duped by the Antichrist. We saw they'll be killed and lay out in the streets of Jerusalem after three days raised from the dead and assumed into heaven. In terms of persecution, we saw that all the evil men in the world will be enlisted together in the army of the Antichrist, that St. Robert thinks that the greater part of the army of the Antichrist will either be made up of barbarians arising from the land of Magog, or else that the army will be extremely brutal and cruel because the men from Magog are proverbially noted for being savage. We saw the land of Magog runs from the Danube River to China. We saw he'll first ferociously persecute Catholics, that this persecution will be so violent that all public religious ceremonies at the Catholic Church will totally cease. That includes the public celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Finally, we saw that he'll rule the world for three and a half years, and then while attempting a blasphemous imitation of our Lord's ascension into heaven from Mount Olivet, we saw that St. Michael will slam duck him right into hell. Why do we spend so much time on this topic? I can't even drive to Mass without seeing rapture bumper stickers. The bookstores are full of this stuff. The TV, there's movies. You can't, we have to drive out this rubbish with the truth. We have to be informed by what the church teaches and not what a bunch of people that have made these things up think. There is no such thing as a rapture. This was cooked up by a Protestant preacher from the Plymouth Brethren about 150 years ago, John Darby. No such thing. It is pure fiction. No millennium. There's no such thing as a thousand-year reign of peace with our Lord as King. It was condemned centuries ago under the name of Killianism. You can look that up. It's spelled with a C-H. In 1944, the Holy Office of the Inquisition condemned this error once more. It doesn't exist. I don't care what you've read. Okay. What ought we to do then? Don't get panicky or depressed. The infinitely wise God knows from all eternity exactly when he wants us to live. And he'll give us all the graces we need at any time in history when we're living, to become the saints that he was calling us to be. We're in the church militant, not the church crybaby. We're soldiers of Christ. Here we are in the battle. It's a battle any time you live in history. Who cares? If we're living in the end of the world, and I'm not up here telling you that, if we are, though, who cares? God put us here now. He knows what he's doing. So what do we do? We live a good Catholic life. Get serious about the sacraments. Get serious about holiness. Stop sinning. Grow in holiness. 
Make good confessions. Make fervent communion. Say your daily rosary. Fervent prayer. St. Alphonsus says, The man who prays will be saved. The man who does not pray will not be saved. It's a pretty simple equation. We just do what we're supposed to do, when we're supposed to do it, in the best possible way, and God will reward us. Let's start this morning with a brief review. Last week we looked at two of the absolutely certain signs of the end of the world, according to St. Robert Bellarmine. The gospel must be preached in the whole world. The Roman Empire must be terminated. We spent some time considering the meaning of the termination of the Roman Empire, relying on the commentary of Cardinal Manning. We saw that the manifestation of the Antichrist has been hindered by a system or a man. We saw that the system hindering the man- manifestation of the Antichrist was initially the political might of the heathen Roman Empire, which was then lifted up and spiritualized by the spiritual power of the Church, penetrating through the empire, and finally was crowned with Christendom, the great family of Christian nations, which assumed the place of the Roman Empire. We sought the Holy Father, the very authority under whom and around whom the whole family of Christian nations were gathered, was the man who had hindered the manifestation of the Antichrist. We saw that only two possible societies, the natural society, with a political order established without reference to our Lord's incarnation, and the supernatural society, with a political order which is faithful to the teaching of the Catholic Church. And we also saw that once a supernatural society admits those who deny the incarnation to an equality of privileges, then the whole foundation of the social life and order of that society drops from the supernatural level to the level of mere nature. And we saw that this was precisely what was foretold of the anti-Christian period. We saw that the manifestation of Antichrist cannot occur till this great revolt, this great apostasy of the Catholic nations defecting from the true faith, plunging from the supernatural order to the natural order, plunging from a political order based on the incarnation of our Lord to a political order which is not based on the incarnation. We saw that once this occurs, the nations will no longer have any unified principle of law and order. We saw that once this apostasy reaches its climax, that is to say, once the formerly Catholic nations have left their unity with the Holy Father and their foundation in the true faith, then there will no longer remain any bulwark or security to prevent the rising up of social disorder and lawlessness. And then in that context of chaos and immorality, the man of sin, the lawless one, the Antichrist, will become manifest. We saw that because the power which has hindered the development of the anti-Christian social disorder is divine, that it cannot be taken away simply by the rebellious will of men until the hour that's foreordained by God. We saw that at the end of the world, at the end of the world, the Roman Empire shall pass into democracies. We saw that according to the fathers at that time, the Gentile nations will reject Catholicism, leave the worship of the true God, and turn back to paganism. That's where we left off last week. Let's start today by taking an extremely brief look at some of what St. Robert has summarized about the man of sin. St. Robert says that the Antichrist is a man, one man according to Scripture and all the fathers. He states that there are two most certain facts about him. First, he is principally coming for the Jews and will be received by them as the Messiah, as was stated by our Lord to the Jews, you have rejected me, but another will come in his own name, and him you will not reject. St. Robert points out that this is taught by all the fathers and by St. Paul as well in Second Thessalonians 2, 10, and 11. According to St. Robert, the second most certain fact is that Antichrist will be born of Jewish stock, be circumcised, and observe the Sabbath at least for a time. St. Robert also points out a fearful symmetry. Quote, Without a doubt, the Antichrist will first attract those who are prepared to receive him. And the Jews expect a temporal messianic king of such a kind as the Antichrist will be. Just as Christ first came to the Jews, to whom he was promised and by whom he was expected, and then later he joined the Gentiles to himself, so also the Antichrist will first go to the Jews, by whom he is expected, and then later, one after another, he will subject all the Gentiles to himself. Close quote. Parenthetical note, subjecting the Gentiles to himself may be far easier for the Antichrist than it sounds. 
In fact, uh, it looks like many are specifically looking forward to his coming. For example, the Muslims who don't believe our Lord died on the cross are expecting our Lord to come back and break the cross. The Buddhists, and oddly enough, many New Agers, are looking forward to what appears to be the last incarnation of the Buddha, someone they call the Lord Maitreya. And the dispensational Protestants are expecting our Lord to return and rule from the temple in Jerusalem. Sounds like a whole raft of sitting ducks. Let's continue. St. Robert points out that the Antichrist is not the devil incarnate because only God can take on another nature. The devil has an angelic nature, so he can't become incarnate. He can only possess a man. But as St. Robert notes, quote, he will be the most perfect instrument of the devil, so that in him is the bodily expression of all possible diabolical malice, just as in Christ our Lord was a bodily expression of all divine goodness. Close quote. We all know that the number of his name is 666. St. Robert quotes St. Irenaeus at some length on this topic. Now, St. Irenaeus states that the name of the Antichrist is a secret kept by God until he arrives, since he isn't worthy to have his name pre-announced by heaven. According to St. Irenaeus, St. John the Apostle warned that no one should attempt to guess this name from the number 666, and that those who do attempt to guess this will be easily deceived by him when he arrives under his own name, since they will not be on their guard against him. As to the seat of the Antichrist, where will he rule? St. Paul wrote that the Antichrist would take his seat in the temple of God, claiming himself to be God. What is meant here? This is a very interesting discussion. We can only touch it briefly. St. Robert gives two possibilities. The first possibility is Rome. As that great doctor St. Jerome says, quote, He shall sit in the temple of God, either Jerusalem as some think, or in the church as is more truly thought. Close quote. Ecumenus, who says, quote, He did not see the temple of Jerusalem, but the church of Christ. Close quote. So Rome is one possibility. The other possibility is Jerusalem. As St. Robert states, quote, But nevertheless, the true opinion is that the Antichrist should rule from Jerusalem, not from Rome, from the temple of Solomon and the throne of David, and not the temple of St. Peter and the Apostolic See. Close quote. St. Robert supports this argument using both scripture and tradition, showing that this is the common teaching of the fathers, even showing that elsewhere St. Jerome has written of the Antichrist being in Jerusalem. He points out that none of the ancient fathers, either Latin or Greek, used the word temple for Christian churches, nor was this word used by the apostles for that purpose. St. Robert quotes Lactantius, who states that after the termination of the Roman Empire, during the time of the Antichrist, the supreme rule will pass over to Asia, and the Orient will dominate while the West is in servitude. Lactantius clearly states in what part of Asia the Antichrist shall rule. That's Syria. A particular part of Syria, now remember, this is the ancient uh, Latin terminology. The particular part of Syria uh, in which the Antichrist shall be is Judea. St. Robert also discusses the teaching of the Antichrist and points out four major doctrines. First, he will deny that Jesus is the Christ, as we read in 1 John 2.22. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denieth the Father and the Son. Therefore, he will attack everything our Savior instituted, such as baptism, confirmation, and so forth. He shall teach the Jewish laws, such as circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, and ancient ceremonies have not ceased, but still have force. Second, he will assert that he himself is the true Christ promised in the Law and Prophets, as we read in John chapter 5, and verse 43. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Third, he will proclaim himself to be God and wish to be worshipped as God, as we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. So that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. And finally, he will proclaim that not only is he God, but also that he is the only God, and he will attack all other gods, both the true God and all the false gods, even the idols as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Who opposeth and is lifted up above all that is called God or that is worshipped. And in Daniel 11. And he shall make no account of the God of his fathers, and he shall not regard any gods, for he shall rise up against all things. St. Robert speaks of the satanic powers of the Antichrist and points out that it is clearly taught in both Scripture and the 24th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel 
in the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as well as tradition, that the Antichrist will possess quasi-miraculous powers of satanic origin. And by these diabolical powers, he will perform many miracles which appear to be miraculous. He will appear to raise the dead and heal the sick, but these will be demonic illusions. They will not be true healings. His marvels will all have natural causes, but these will be hidden from men, and so they will appear to be miraculous. St. Robert comments on the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse, where the dragon gives his power and throne great authority to the beast. And then one of the heads of the beast has a mortal wound, but the wound is healed, which makes the whole world follow the beast with great wonder. One of the heads of the beast has a mortal wound. The wound is healed, which makes the whole world follow the beast with great wonder. St. Robert explains this passage about the beast's head having a mortal wound, which is then healed. Quote, Nearly all the ancient fathers explain this of the Antichrist himself, who will fake his own death, and then by diabolical powers raise himself up again, so that he might imitate the true death and resurrection of Christ, and by this means seduce many. Close quote. All the fathers teach that the Antichrist will be the most incredible magician. He will be possessed by the devil from his very conception, or at least by his infancy, and the Antichrist will perform all his marvels by satanic power. St. Cyril states that the Antichrist will be the most highly instructed magician, learned in witchcraft, spells, and the black arts, and his marvels are called lying wonders because they are performed by the father of lies. So we've seen a few more details about the Antichrist. He'll be possessed, at least since his infancy. He'll be learned in all the occult arts, sorcery, incantations, all the black arts. Because of his incredible powers of satanic origin, he'll be able to perform many incredible things which will seem like true miracles to men. But why will the Antichrist perform all these miracles? St. Robert notes that the purpose of all these fake satanic wonders will be so that he can prove that he is God, just as Christ our Lord did true miracles to demonstrate his divinity. So he'll do this miracle so he can convince everybody he's the Christ, so he can convince everybody that he is God. Now that we have a general outline of the character of the Antichrist himself, let's tune to to the two absolutely certain signs which accompany the Antichrist, the preaching of Enoch and Elias, that's Elijah, and the savage persecution and ending of all public masses. First, the preaching of Enoch and Elias. Elias and Elijah, just two different ways of saying the same name. Enoch is a great grandpa of Noah. We can read about him in in Genesis chapter 5. He was taken up. Elias is the prophet who, as we all know, was taken up in the chariot of fire. Neither of these men have died yet. As St. Robert points out, Scripture proves that these two prophets still live and will return. They will return to preach against the Antichrist. Enoch will preach to the Gentiles and Elijah to the Jews. They will both preach and perform miracles, convincing many to reject the Antichrist and return to the Holy Faith. St. Robert teaches that it is heresy or proximate heresy to deny that Enoch and Elijah are personally going to return to oppose the the Antichrist. Thanks to Elias' preaching, the Jews will largely convert. St. Robert, quote, Enoch and Elias will come again. They are still alive. And the reason they are still living is that they will oppose the Antichrist when he comes, and they will conserve the elect in the faith of Christ, and indeed they will convert the Jews. And this is obvious in the words, and he shall restore all things. For to restore all things means to call all Jews and heretics, and perhaps many Catholics who have been deceived by the Antichrist, true the true faith. Close quote, St. Robert. Then Enoch and Elias will be killed in Jerusalem and lay in the street for three days, while the forces of evil rejoice with satanic glee. But then, to the horror of the followers of the Antichrist, both Enoch and Elias will be resurrected and then assumed into heaven, which St. John refers to in the 11th chapter of the Apocalypse. I'll read an abbreviated version of that, uh, that section. Apocalypse 11, 3 and following. And I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred sixty days clothed in sackcloth. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, where their Lord also was crucified. And the nations shall see their bodies for three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their bodies to be laid in sepulchres. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. 
And after three days and a half, the spirit of life of, of, of God from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them that saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither. And they went up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Close quote, the Holy Ghost. So Enoch and Elias are still alive. They're coming back during the reign of the Antichrist to pose him with preaching and miracles to convert the Jews who will finally become Catholics. Also to convert heretics and Catholics who have been duped by the Antichrist. They will be killed and laid out in the streets of Jerusalem. After three days they will be raised from the dead and assumed into heaven. Now let's turn to the second absolutely certain sign which accompanies the Antichrist, the savage persecution and ending of all public masses. St. Robert, quote, Absolutely all the evil men together shall be in the army of the Antichrist and shall with open authority attack all the saints of the church. Nowadays there are many men who pretend to be in the church, who conceal their malice, whose hearts are, uh, whose hearts are outside the church, although their bodies remain inside. But at that time, as St. Augustine says, their hidden hatred shall all break out in open persecution. Close quote. And how vicious will this persecution be? St. Augustine says during the time of the Antichrist, the devil should be loosed, and therefore the persecution will be that much greater than all the preceding persecutions in history. This persecution, occurring while the final judgment is imminent, shall be the last which will be endured by the Holy Church throughout the world, the whole city of Christ being assailed by the whole city of the devil as each exists on earth. St. Hippolytus and St. Cyril say that the martyrs killed by the Antichrist will be more glorious than all the preceding martyrs because all the martyrs before the time of the Antichrist had to battle against human ministers of the devil, but these last martyrs shall have to fight against the raging devil himself. St. Robert makes three points concerning the passage in the 20th chapter of the Apocalypse which describes the attack of Gog and Magog on the saints. First, the battle of Gog and Magog is actually the battle of the Antichrist against the church, the very last persecution which the Antichrist will raise up against the church all over the world. That's the first point. The second point St. Robert makes is it is very probable that Gog signifies the Antichrist himself and Magog signifies his army. And the third point, the Antichrist army, Magog, has a strange name because of the people who are in the army. So what does it mean? Well, in chapter 10 of the book of Genesis, there's a list of the descendants of Noah after the flood. It's a list known as the Table of Nations, and the name Magog is found in there. Magog is the father of a people traditionally known as the Scythians. Scythia, the homeland of the Scythians, is an ancient term for a region of Europe and Asia north of the Black and Caspian Seas, stretching from the Danube to China. It's what we now know as Kazakhstan, southern Russia, the Ukraine, and the surrounding regions. St. Robert says that, quote, the army of the Antichrist is called Magog because the greater part of the Antichrist army will either be established from barbarians arising from Scythia, such as, such as the Turks, the Tartars, and others, or what I think is more probable, because the army shall be immensely savage and cruel, close quote. And for the ending of the public mass, quote, the persecution of the Antichrist will be the most severe and the most notorious so that all public religious ceremonies and sacrifices will cease. That this final persecution will be the most violent is obvious from the words of our Lord in Matthew twenty four twenty one. For there shall be then great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world, neither shall be. Close quote, St. Robert. Quote, In the time of the Antichrist, because of the horrible persecution, the public and daily, public and daily office and sacrifice of the church will cease as Daniel clearly teaches in chapter 12 and verse 11. And from the time when the continual sacrifice be taken away, there should be 1,290 days. The consensus of all the fathers is that in this place Daniel is speaking of the time of the Antichrist. And what this passage means is that the Antichrist will prohibit all divine worship which is now practiced in the Church of Christ, and most especially he will prohibit the most holy sacrifice, the Mass. Close quote, Cardinal Bellarmine. So the persecution of the Antichrist will be the last persecution in the world and savage beyond all uh, possible previous persecutions. In case uh, anybody might wonder why, it's because purgatory ends on Judgment Day, and so all the saints that are alive at the end of the world have to get their purgatory time uh, done before death, and that's why God allows the Antichrist to be so savage, so they get their suffering done right away, because there is no purgatory once judgment comes. The army of the Antichrist will be made up largely of men from the barbarian tribes of Central Asia or of men whose cruelty will be comparable. 
The attacks will be so violent that all public ceremonies of the Catholic Church, including the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, will cease. There are two signs which fall upon the rule of the Antichrist, the destruction of the Antichrist and the end of the world. We'll set aside the end of the world to a later date because there's far too much to cover today. And so we'll end today by looking at the destruction of the Antichrist. St. Robert teaches that the length of time the Antichrist will rule the world is clear from chapters 7 and 12 of Daniel and chapters 11, 12, and 13 of the Apocalypse. The Antichrist will rule the world for 3.5 years. And he explains the reason why the time of the two witnesses, Enoch and Elias, will be 1,260 days, while the time of the Antichrist will be 1,290 days. The Antichrist rule will be 30 days longer, since he will rule for another month after he kills Enoch and Elias. St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Gregory the Great, and St. Thomas say that at this time, the Antichrist will go to Mount Olivet. Then in a totally blasphemous imitation of the ascension of Christ our Lord, the Antichrist, by the power of Satan, will ascend into the air, pretending that he is returning to heaven. So he'll be lifted up by the demons, and everybody will be admiring him as he rises up and acclaiming him as God. But suddenly, by the order of Christ our Lord, St. Michael will knock him out of the air. He'll fall to the earth, which will swallow him up, just as it did the men who rebelled against Moses, and he'll fall down into hell. And thus the terrible end of the Antichrist. The fathers teach that about a month and a half after the death of Antichrist, our Lord will come in judgment. But that's a topic for another day. Okay, let's review. Today we took a quick look at the son of perdition. He'll be Jewish, observe the Jewish laws at least for some time. He will not be the devil incarnate, but he will be possessed in the most perfect bodily instrument of Satan. Although the number of his name is 666, we've been explicitly forbidden from guessing who he might be using this number in order to end up, or in order to avoid winding up as one of his followers. He'll apparently rule the world from Jerusalem. He'll deny that Jesus is the Christ and institute Jewish laws. He will proclaim himself to be Christ and God and will be demanded to be worshipped as such and will attack all the other gods, even the true God. He'll be a master of the black arts, a sorcerer like none that has ever lived, consecrated as Satan from his conception or infancy, raised up and tutored and skilled in all the satanic arts of magic, incantations, and such like. He'll have apparently miraculous powers of satanic origin, all of which are lies, but which include the ability to heal the sick and apparently even raise the dead. He'll apparently raise himself from the dead. He'll perform all these marvels with one goal in mind, to convince everybody that he is the Christ and that he is God. We took a look at three more of the absolutely certain signs of the end of the world, according to St. Robert. The two signs which accompany the Antichrist, the preaching of the two witnesses, Enoch and Elias, and the Antichrist's persecution, and finally, the destruction of the Antichrist. We saw that Enoch and Elias are still alive. They're coming back during the reign of the Antichrist to oppose him with preaching miracles to convert the Jews who will finally become Catholic also to convert Catholics that have been duped by the Antichrist and heretics. They'll be killed and laid out in the streets of Jerusalem. After three days, they'll be raised from the dead and assumed into heaven. We saw that during the savage persecution of the Antichrist, all the evil men in the world will be enlisted in the army of the Antichrist. St. Robert thinks the greater part of this army of the Antichrist will either be made up of barbarians rising from the land of Magog, or else he thinks the army will be extremely brutal and cruel because the men from Magog are proverbially noted for being savage. We saw that the the land of Magog runs from the Danube River to China. We saw this persecution will be so violent that all public religious ceremonies of the Catholic Church will totally cease. Benediction, exposition, vespers, holy sacrifice, the Mass. All public ceremonies will cease. Finally, we saw that he'll rule the world for three and a half years, and while attempting a blasphemous imitation of our Lord's ascension into heaven from Mount Olivet, we saw that St. Michael will slam dunk him into hell. This has basically been a book report, a woven out of quotes and paraphrases of St. Robert Bellman's work on the Antichrist. If it seems difficult to understand to some degree, well, there's a reason for that. It is. Uh, remember that prophecy is only st- understood completely in its fulfillment. Why do we spend two weeks on this? In the first place, we're not doing it to be sensational. It's part of the church liturgical year. The church has placed this topic before us. In the second place, we live in a time where there's such massive error and heretical confusion surrounding us. It's spewing out of the radios, out of the TVs, and all kinds of books. And in the third place, because for the past century, the popes have given us a pretty fair warning that we're living in a time which at the very least is a type of the great apostasy if not the real thing. So what are we supposed to do? 
Well, we see the first thing is we don't want to start imitating Chicken Little. We need to remember that God's in charge. He knows what he's doing. He loves us. He knows exactly what he wanted each one of us to live. So what does he expect of us? That we stay in the state of grace and do our duty in our state of life. We need to be serious about the commandments. We need to be serious about our faith. We need to be serious about holiness. Say your rose and your three Hail Marys and your prayers every day. Wear your brown scapular. Stop sinning. Go to confession every two weeks. Make fervent communions. Put God first. And strive to become holy. Do your duty. It's pretty basic. Just do your duty. Once again, we've come to the end of another liturgical year. Once again, the Church asks us to consider the end of the world. A couple points before we get into that. First, there's a whole, uh, like a flood of end of the world nonsense, Protestant errors floating around. Uh, we don't want to fall for any of that. So any, if the enemy have any of these kind of things around your house, you open the door, you wood stove, and chuck it in. Second, the teaching of the Catholic Church is clear. There's no such thing as the rapture, and there's no such thing as the millennium, this so-called thousand-year reign of Christ our Lord. He came visibly the first time as a baby on his mission of mercy, and he'll come to us visibly and finally the second time at the end of the world as our judge. That's it. There's not like some two-and-a-half comings of our Lord. He comes twice. That's it. No rapture, no millennium, period. Third, in today's gospel and elsewhere, our Lord has commanded us to read the signs of the times. Watch ye therefore, because you know not at what hour your Lord will come. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches. Blessed is he that watches. So we're supposed to watch, but we know not the hour. So if we hear anyone setting dates when all these future things are to come to pass, we should remind ourselves of the teaching of the Fifth Lateran Council. And I quote, Preachers are in no way to presume to preach or declare a fixed time for future evils, the coming of Antichrist, or the precise day of judgment. For truth says it is not for us to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Let it be known that those who have hitherto dared to declare such things are liars, and that because of them not a little authority has been taken away from those who preach the truth. Close quote. Lateran 5. So on the one hand, we're commanded to watch the signs. On the other hand, we're reminded that we can't be completely precise since no one knows the exact dates or times, okay? Fourth point. Obviously, this is an exciting topic but we're not supposed to have some sort of chicken little, the sky is falling tizzy fit when we start thinking about it. The example we should cue off of is that of St. John Birchman. One St. Saint, Saint John Birchman said that, that uh, great uh, Jesuit scholastic, it was recreation one day, and he and his fellow Jesuit scholastics were shooting pool in the recreation room. One of them, one of them said, hey, if you found out the world was going to end suddenly right now, what would you do? And St. John Birchman's just kept shooting pool. He said, I'd keep right on playing billiards. What's the point of the story? The point of the story is it was recreation time, so they're supposed to be recreating, and he was. He's in the state of grace, which we're supposed to be, and he was. We're sp- if we're doing our duty, and we're in the state of grace, we're where we need to be. It's not such a much of a concern of when we live in history as how we die. That's the important thing, how we die. If we die in the state of grace, we'll be saved. So we want to do our duty, stay in the state of grace and do our duty in our state of life and not have some sort of chicken little fit every time we start thinking about things like this. Let's turn to the topic. Before we do, we have to make sure we understand the meaning of the word type. What is a type? A type is a person a thing or an action that actually exists, but it is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. So type is a person, thing, or action that actually exists, but it's intended by God to foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. We'll consider a few examples to see how it works. In the book of Judges, 
we see Jael. Now, this is the woman that saved the people of Israel. And how did she do that? Because she pounded a tenth stake through the head of a sleeping enemy general. Later in the same book, we see the woman who saved Israel when she dropped an upper millstone on the head of an em- another enemy general. In the book of Judith, we see Judith who saves Israel when she cuts the head off an enemy general. Now, in each one of these cases, there are at least three types. Obviously, Israel existed of itself, but Israel is also intended by God to prefigure the Catholic Church. So Israel is a type of the Catholic Church. The enemy generals really existed, but they were also intended by God to represent Satan and the enemies of the Church, so the enemy generals were types of the devil. And the women who crushed the heads of the enemy generals really existed too, but they're obviously intended by God to prefigure her. And if you look carefully at the statue, you'll see what she's doing. She's stomping on the head of a serpent. Okay, Our Lady crushes the head of a serpent. So when we consider these women and what they did for Israel, we can see foreshadowings of Our Lady and what she does for the Catholic Church. So what's a type? A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists, but which is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow future person, thing, or action. All right, so much for the introduction. We'll turn to the topic at hand. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, St. Paul explicitly teaches that the day of the Lord, judgment day, the end of the world, can't come until there first be an apostasy, a great falling away from the true faith, a great revolt against the true faith, and that in the wake of that apostasy, the great apostasy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, be revealed. The fathers and doctors have explained what this apostasy means. For example, St. Thomas Aquinas explains that this apostasy will be separation from the faith and from obedience to the Pope. Pope St. Leo the Great teaches that indeed the great apostasy will mean abandoning the faith and obedience to the Pope. St. Augustine adds that this event must precede the coming of the Antichrist. And St. Augustine states that not all will abandon the faith, but that few will will retain it. So for the next two weeks, we'll consider a historical period and a ruler with the, which the fathers and doctors have always considered to be a very clear type of the great apostasy and the Antichrist. Why would we want to study this man in his times? Because the clearer we see the foreshadowings, the clearer an idea it will give us of the actual future reality that they point towards. So today what we want to do is consider some of, more the prominent, some of the more prominent features of the apostasy which took place in Jerusalem around 170 B.C., and next week we'll consider the man who's such a clear type of the Antichrist. We'll do this by first uh, reading lines from the Holy Scriptures. It's found in the inspired books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And then we'll reflect on the meanings of those scriptures by turning to the great commentary, great scriptural commentary. It was prepared some 400 years ago by a saintly Belgian Jesuit, Father Cornelius Lapide, who at the order of the Pope spent some 40 years assembling the works of the Church Fathers into a massive 21-volume, line-by-line commentary on the scriptures. So we'll get started. The inspired word of God, quote, In those days, there went out of Israel wicked men. And they persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathens that are round about us. And some of the people determined to do this. Close quote. Cornelius Lapide commenting on that line. The leader of the wicked men was Jason, who treacherously managed to seize the high priesthood for himself. Why? Why? so that he might introduce Gentile rituals and customs, and especially false religions and idolatry into Judea, and pursue the attending unrestrained, unbridled, open lusts. So what's happening here? We see that those with the true faith, instead of carefully, even scrupulously, remaining faithful to God and avoiding any pagan practices and trying to convert their pagan neighbors by their example and by their words, Instead, they're turning away from their holy religion and allowing themselves to become paganized. Notice also that the leaders are priests. It's one good priest I know likes to point out. Whenever you see the church go down, it's an inside job. Notice also 
that we see here a link between false religions, idolatry, heresy, and lust. Inspired word of God. And they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the laws of the nations. Close quote. So they built a gymnasium in the holy city. And you might think, so what? It might help to know that what we mean by gymnasium is not what it meant in those days. Gymnos is a Greek word for naked. It was a place to exercise buck naked. So much for modesty, but think of where they're at. Not only are they in the Holy Land, they're right there in the Holy City. But there are more details we find in sacred scripture about this. This will be slightly edited and paraphrased, uh, not because I want to be God's editor, but because it needs to be because of the youngsters. Quote, the high priest Jason began to bring over his countrymen to the fashion of the heathens. And he abolished the lawful ordinances of the citizens and brought in fashions that were perverse. For he had the boldness to set up a gymnasium and to put all the choicest use in certain types of houses. Close quote. Now I have to have an even more highly paraphrased uh, version of Cornelius Lapide's commentary. Not only did the youth learn the Greek games, such as the discus, etc., but also they were corrupted by being taught all types of perverse sins. They were certain types of clothing as a sign of types of immodest behavior. They were consecrated to pagan gods, in other words, devils, such as Astarte or Venus. The houses they lived in were connected to taverns. Actually, the whole thing is so bad, I don't even like reading it in Latin. Cornelius, Sodapide, back to him. Here we're taught that just as the true religion is associated with purity and chastity, so impurities and lust are associated with false religions and heresy. So as the apostasy progresses, we see immodesty and nakedness and perverse behavior. You might just think of San Francisco and Boston. Another slightly edited and paraphrased quote from the inspired word of God. Now this was not the beginning, but an increase in progress of heathenist practices through the abominable and unheard of wickedness of Jason, that impious wretch and no priest. It grew so bad that the priests were not now occupied about the offices of the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the games and of the unlawful allowances thereof. And disdaining the honors of their fathers, they esteemed the Grecian glories for the best, and they followed earnestly the heathen customs, and in all things they coveted to be like them, who were their enemies and murderers. It grew so bad that priests were not not occupied about the offices of the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the unlawful allowances. And Coinus the Lapidae enlightens us, quote, The allowances were called unlawful because these were young, shameless, lewd women. Close quote. So the priests abandoned and despised their priestly duties, Remember that a vast number of the sacrifices they're neglecting are sin offerings. Priests begin to act like heathens. They start running around to the most foul worldly entertainments and running around with companions with loose morals. We continue. Word of God. Quote, The temple was full of the riot and revelings of the Gentiles and of men sinning with lewd women. Close quote. So you have parties, pagan rites, and lewd behavior going on in the holiest place in the universe. The inspired word of God. Quote, And women thrust themselves of their accord into the holy places. Close quote. Well, of course, uh, since the very beginning, since the time of Adam and the true worship of God, women have always been forbidden from this kind of behavior. In the temple, if a woman were to go into any of the holy places proper to the priest, the strict duty of the Levites was to kill her. There's plenty more, but we can get the general picture. Let's remember what a type is. A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists, which is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. Now keep in mind that the apostasy at the time of the Maccabees is a type of the great apostasy, In other words, it gives us a prefigurement of the great apostasy, and all the fathers have seen this. Among other things, the Jewish people prefigure the Catholic people. The Jewish priests prefigure the Catholic priests. 
the Jewish temple, prefigures the Catholic Church and parishes, and the city of Jerusalem prefigures the world. So based on the indications we've seen in the prefigurement of the apostasy during the fulfillment, in other words, during the great apostasy itself, here are a few of the things that we might expect to see. A dramatic rise in imas behavior and dress and perverse behaviors, most notably certain politically correct sins and those associated with Boston. Catholics abandoning the true faith the traditions of their fathers, and turning to false religions, paganism, and worldliness. Catholic priests neglecting their priestly duties, especially the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the application of the once-for-all sin offering to sinners in the confessional. Catholic priests engaged in worldly entertainments, spending time in the company of companions with loose morals. Women invading the sanctuaries of the true religion. The behavior inside Catholic churches becoming increasingly unbecoming, disruptive, and irreverent. So, if we were heeding our Lord's command to watch, these would be some of the indicators we would be watching for. We need to keep in mind that our Lord has actually appointed official watchmen to keep us posted. Let's hear from them, because they have the office to watch. The first two quotes have been edited for the sake of time. Quote, Who can fail to see that society is, at the present time, more than in any past age, suffering from a terrible and deep-rooted malady which, developing every day, and eating into its inmost being is dragging it to destruction. You understand, venerable brethren, what this disease is, apostasy from God. There is a sacrilegious war which is now almost everywhere stirred up and fomented against God, and we find extinguished in the vast majority of men all respect for the eternal God and no regard paid in public or private life to God's holy will, Instead, every effort is used to utterly destroy the memory and knowledge of God. When all this is considered, there is good reason to fear, lest this great perversity may be, as it were, a foretaste, and perhaps the beginning of those evils which are reserved for the last days, and that there may already be in the world the son of perdition of whom the apostle speaks in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Such, in truth, is the audacity and the wrath employed everywhere in persecuting religion, in combating the dogmas of the faith, in brazen effort to uproot and destroy all relations between man and the divinity. Well, on the other hand, and this according to the same apostle, is the distinguishing mark of Antichrist. Man has with infinite arrogance put himself in the place of God, raising himself above all that is called God in such wise that he has mocked God's majesty and as it were, made of the universe a temple wherein he himself is to be adored. He sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Second Thessalonians 2.2, 2, close quote. Pope St. Pius X, First Encyclical, October 1903. Second quote, quote, Everyone should examine the world seated in wickedness, First John 5.19, with his eyes and with his mind, Young people are induced to renounce Christ, to blaspheme, and to attempt the worst crimes of lust. The whole Christian people are constantly in danger of falling away from the faith. These things, in truth, are so sad that you might say that such events foreshadow and portend the beginning of sorrows. That is to say, of those that shall be brought by the man of sin, who is lifted above all that is called God or is worshipped. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 but is yet more to be lamented, lamented, venerable brethren, that among the faithful themselves there are found so many men who are laboring under an incredible ignorance of divine things and who are infected with false doctrines, who lead a life of vice without the light of the true faith, so that they truly seem to sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. There's a greatly increasing carelessness concerning church rules and discipline. Now, those ancient traditions by which family life is governed, 
and the sanctity of marriage is safeguarded. The education of children is altogether neglected or else it is depraved. There is a sad forgetfulness of Christian modesty, especially in the life and dress of women. There is an unbridled desire for material goods, and lastly, a contempt for the word of God, whereby faith itself is injured or endangered. But all these evils, as it were, culminate in the evil of those who, following the example of the traitor Judas, either receive Holy Communion rashly and sacrilegiously, or else go over to the camp of the enemy. And thus, even against our will, the thought rises in the mind that now those days draw near of which our Lord prophesied. And because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. Matthew twenty four twelve. Close quote. Pope Pius XI, Encyclical on Reparation of the Sacred Heart, May 1928. So an encyclical was written roughly 100 years ago and 80 years ago. The popes explicitly warned us it may very well be the beginning of the end. Since then, quote, We are overwhelmed with sadness and anguish, seeing that the wickedness of perverse men has reached a degree of impiety that is unbelievable and absolutely unknown in other times. Close quote. Pius XII, 1949. Quote, Venerable brethren, you are well aware that almost the whole human race is today allowing itself to be driven into two opposing camps, for Christ or against Christ. The human race is involved today in a supreme crisis which will issue in its salvation by Christ or in its dire destruction. Close quote. Pius XII, 1951. Quote, I sometimes read the gospel passages of the end times, and I attest that at this time some signs of this end are emerging. Close quote. Pope Paul VI, 1977. End quote. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in our countries, in this Europe of Christian tradition? This is an open question, which clearly reveals the depth and the drama of one of the most serious challenges which we are called to face. European culture gives the impression of silent apostasy on the part of people who have all that they need and who live as if God does not exist. Close quote. Blessed John Paul II, 2003. Okay, for a full century, the popes have been reading the signs of the times and warning us, warning us that things are grinding to a close. So what are we supposed to do? Remember that God's in charge. He loves us. He knows exactly when he wants each one of us to live. We don't want to imitate Chicken Little. I want to take St. John Birchman's. We need to do our duty in our state and life. We need to get serious about our faith, serious about personal holiness. Say rosary and three Hail Marys every day, no exceptions. Wear your brown scapular. Stop sinning. Go to confession at least every two weeks. Make fervent communions. Spend time before our Lord in the most blessed sacrament. Put God first. Become holy. Do your duty. It's pretty basic. Everybody just has to do his duty. On the last Sunday of the liturgical year and the first Sunday of Advent, the church asks us to consider the end of the world. And we've been doing just that. Let's have a quick review of what we saw this last week. First, we saw that the important thing is not so much when in history we live, but how we die. We're all going to die. We're all going to be judged. The important thing is to do our duty and stay in the state of grace. And then whenever we die, we're saved. Second, we learned what the word type means. A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists but is also intended by God to prefigure a future person, a thing, or action. And we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, St. Paul explicitly teaches that the end of the world can't come unless there first be an apostasy, a great falling away from the true faith, and then the Antichrist, the man of sin, be revealed. 
And then we took a quick look at a historical example, which the fathers and doctors have always considered to be a very clear type of the great apostasy, and that's the one that occurred in Jerusalem about 170 B.C. And we saw that, among other things, during the great apostasy itself, we would expect to see such things as the behavior inside uh, our churches becoming increasingly uh, disruptive and irreverent. Uh, we'd see people banding the true faith, all the traditions of their fathers, and turning to false religions, paganism, and worldliness. And we'd note, especially among the laity and priests, a dramatic rise in immodest behavior, dress, and perversities, most especially those associated with the Bay Area and San Francisco. Finally, we saw that for the last century, the popes have been explicitly warning us about the great apostasy. So much for the review. Now let's take a look today at the ruler who prefigures the Antichrist, his, whose name is Antiochus Epiphanes. After Alexander the Great died in 323 B.C., his kingdom was split into four parts. At the time of the Maccabees, which was some 150 years after Alexander's death, the part of his kingdom, which included the Holy Land, was ruled by Antiochus Epiphanes, who's a Greek king of Syria. Today we'll consider certain features of his rule uh, by reading lines from the inspired uh, books of First and Second Maccabees. Uh, now keep in mind there's a lot more there than what we'll be able to cover in the time we've got, and as usual we'll do a lot of cutting and splicing. After we read some scripture, then once again for comments we'll turn to the great commentary by Father Quinius Lapide. So let's get started. The inerrant inspired word of God. And some of the Jewish people determined to make a covenant with the heathens and went to the king, Antiochus Epiphanes, and he authorized them to follow the ordinances of the heathens. Now, who went to Antiochus Epiphanes with this request? Quinius Lapide, quote, The leader of the wicked men was Jason, who treacherously managed to seize the high priesthood for himself. Close quote. So here we see ambitious apostate priests paving the way for the tyrannical rule of Antiochus Epiphanes and his paganism. Last week we saw the state that the people fell into, uh, this resulting apostasy. Then suddenly, in the midst of all apostasy, there appeared terrors from heaven and great signs. The inspired and inerrant word of God, quote, And it came to pass that through the whole city of Jerusalem, for the space of forty days, there were seen horsemen running in the air, in gilded raiment and armed with spears like bands of soldiers, and horses set in order by ranks, running one against another with the shakings of shields and a multitude of men in helmets with drawn swords and casting of darts and glittering of golden armor and of harnesses of all sorts. Wherefore all men prayed that these prodigies might turn to good. Close quote. Cornelius Lapide comments on this, quote, Indeed, this portent was done by the angels, at the command of God, that through these things God might warn the Jews beforehand about the attack soon to be made upon them by Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so now that the Lord has warned everybody about the upcoming attack, Antiochus Epiphanes arrives on the scene in Jerusalem, the inspired inner word of God. Quote, And Antiochus went up to Jerusalem with a great multitude, and he took the city by force of arms. And he commanded the soldiers to kill and not to spare any that came in their way, and to go up into the houses to slay. Thus there was a slaughter of young and old, a destruction of women and children, and killing of virgins and infants. And there were slain in the space of three whole days 80,000. 40,000 were made prisoners, and as many sold as slaves. Close quote. That's still not all. The word of God. Quote, but this was not enough. Antiochus Epiphanes presumed also to enter into the temple, the most holy in all the world. And taking in his wicked hands the holy vessels, he unworthily handled and profaned them. And he proudly entered into the sanctuary and took away the golden altar and the candlestick of light and all the vessels and the veil and the crowns and the golden ornament that was before the temple. And he broke them all in pieces. And he took the silver and gold and the precious vessels and he took the hidden treasures which he found, and when he had taken all away, he departed into his own country. Close quotes. 
So here we see the iconoclasm of Antiochus Epiphanes as he sacks the temple. Iconoclasm is the deliberate destruction of religious artwork and symbols. Why does God allow this arrogant pagan to profane and strip the temple? The inspired word of God gives us the answer. God was angry for a while because of the sins of the inhabitants of the city. And therefore this contempt had happened to the place, and the holy place itself shared in the evils of the people. Close quote. The Hadok commentary. Temples and sacrifices are for our own advantage. God has often suffered sacred places to be profaned when piety had been disregarded. What's the point? As we saw last week, instead of being pious, instead of clinging to the true faith, in large part, the Jewish priests and people had become apostate. The Hadok Commentary, quote, All religious rites are designed for God's glory and man's welfare. Hence, when they cease to serve God, the holy things are destroyed or taken away. All religious rites are designed for God's glory and man's welfare. Hence, when they cease to serve God, the holy things are destroyed or taken away. The holy things are destroyed or taken away when they're no longer used for God's glory and the welfare of man. It's a very serious message here for each one of us. This beautiful liturgy, our holy faith, all this is ours to lose. It's ours to lose. If we're not pious, if we're not serious about avoiding sacrileges, communions, and every kind of irreverent behavior, and training the children in that way too, God will take this all away. And that means all of it. He's done it before. He'll do it again. That's not a prophecy. It's a certainty. God means what he says, and he won't be mocked or trifled with for long. So far, we've seen death and profanation and stripping the temple. It gets worse. Inspired word of God. And King Antiochus wrote to all his kingdom that all the people should be one, and everyone should leave his own law. And many of Israel consented to his service, and they sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And that whosoever would not do this should be put to death. And many of Israel consented. And when the Feast of Bacchus was kept... The Jews were compelled to go about crowned with ivy in honor of Bacchus, and whosoever would not conform themselves to the ways of the Gentiles should be put to death. Here we see the exclusive claims of the one true religion being put to the test. We also see many of the Jews becoming actual pagan idolaters. Quinius Lapidae. Antiochus commanded that there should be uniformity in faith and religion, so that all the people be united in the same superstitions and idolatry just as they were all united in the same kingdom. And therefore, the Jews should abandon the laws and the worship of God handed down to Moses and defile themselves with sacrilegious sacrifices and the superstitions and idols of the Gentiles. And when the Bacchanalia, that is, the Feast of Bacchus, was celebrated, with drinking, dancing, public spectacles, impurities, and all the sins of the flesh, the Jews were forced to wear crowns of ivy in honor of Bacchus and to go around the temple or the city. Close quotes. Now, what is the Bacchanalia? The pagan uh, Roman historian Livy has a description of the Bacchanalian rites, which, with some editing, can be uh, read aloud. Quote, To the religious performances, in the Bacchanalia, to the religious performances were added the pleasures of wine and feasting. When wine, lascivious discourse, night, and the mingling of the sexes had extinguished every sentiment of modesty... Then debaucheries of every kind began to be practiced, as every person found at hand that sort of enjoyment to which he was disposed by the passion predominant in his nature. Nor were they confined to one kind of vice. On account of the loud shouting and the noise of drums and cymbals, none of the cries uttered by the person suffering violation or murder could be heard abroad. Close quote. That's the Bacchanalia. It gets worse. The inspired word of God. King Antiochus set up the abominable idol of desolation upon the altar of God. 
And they built altars throughout all the cities of Judah round about. And they cut in pieces and burnt with fire the books of the law of God. And everyone with whom the books of the Testament of the Lord were found, and whosoever observed the law of the Lord, they put to death according to the edict of the king. And they sacrificed upon the altar of the idol that was over against the altar of God. Close quote. Cornelius Lapide, quote, For Antiochus wished to abolish the worship of the true God and force the Jews to adore his idol. For Antiochus wished to be worshipped as being one with the God Jove himself. Not only did he want to force them to turn away from the worship of God to the worship of Jove, at the same time he wanted to seduce them to commit impurities, which is plainly the work of the devil. Therefore, Antiochus ordered that the idol of Jove be placed in the temple dedicated by a solemn rite and adored, and from thence be called the Temple of Jove. On this altar they sacrificed not only to Jove, but also to Antiochus himself, as if he were a god. For he himself wished to be worshipped as a god, just as was predicted by the prophet Daniel. Therefore Antiochus is a type of the Antichrist. Behold, this is indeed the abomination of desolation, that is the idolatrous abomination which makes all things desolate, predicted more than 300 years before by the prophet Daniel. Close quotes. So there we see the abomination of desolation in the temple, a pagan idol, a demon worshipped by the pagans, is set up in the temple of the true God, and false worship and sacrifices are offered to it. Now there's plenty more that can be said about the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, but we've seen enough to get the general picture. Now remember what a type is. A type is a person, thing, or an action that actually exists, but is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. So based on the indications we've seen in the prefigurement of both the great apostasy and the Antichrist, and since our Lord has commanded us to read the signs of the times, watch ye therefore, because ye know not at what hour your hour will come. Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth. Here are a few signs that Catholics might want to be on the lookout for. Sign. The behavior inside Catholic churches becoming increasingly unbecoming, disruptive, and irreverent. Catholics abandoning the true faith and traditions of their fathers, turning to false religions, paganism, worldliness. Amongst both the laity and priests, a dramatic rise in immodest dress, behavior, and perversities. Most notably, certainly politically correct sins and those associated with Boston. Sign, Catholic priests neglecting their priestly duties, especially the holy sacrifice, the Mass, and the application of the once-for-all sin offering to sinners in the confessional. Sign, sign and portents in the sky. It is true that we haven't seen anything like the angelic battle seen in the skies over Jerusalem. But it is interesting in those days our Lord states that the sun shall be darkened. St. Augustine explains one of the spiritual meanings of our Lord's statement. St. Augustine, quote, The sun, that is to say the church, shall be darkened because in those tremendous temptations and tribulations which shall be in the end of the world, many who had seemed as bright and as firm as the sun and stars shall fall from the faith. Close quote. In today's gospel, when our Lord speaks of signs in the sun and the the powers of heaven shall be shaken, it's hard not to think of Fatima. Sign, the occupation of Jerusalem. In Luke 21, 24, now that's the line found immediately before today's gospel. Our Lord states, quote, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles till the time of the nations be fulfilled, close quote. Cornelius Lapide, quote, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles to the time the nations be fulfilled. That is to say, till the end of the world and of all nations. As the Venerable Bede states, until the plenitude of the Gentiles shall enter into the church of Christ. For Christ has regard to the desolation of Jerusalem. This was foretold by Daniel in chapter 9, where it is said, The desolation shall continue unto the consummation and the end, meaning that Jerusalem after being raised to the ground and laid desolate by Titus, shall no longer be the capital city of the Jews, but shall belong to the Gentiles, and after that to the Christians, and after that to the Saracens and the Turks, as it is at present. Now, he's writing uh, 400 years ago. 
And, of course, uh, Jerusalem was trodden down by the Gentiles for some 19 centuries, right up until uh, the Six-Day War in 1967, uh, back to Cornelius Lapide. And this state of things shall continue until the end of the world. When Antichrist, the King and Messiah, so the Jews, shall fix the seat of his empire at Jerusalem, as is plain from Apocalypse 11.8. And then shall Enoch and Elias resist Antichrist and convert many of the Jews to Christ. After Antichrist is slain, all the Jews shall be brought to Christ by the disciples of Enoch and Elias and shall publicly worship Christ in Jerusalem, as may be easily gathered from Apocalypse 28. Close quote. Sign. The wholesale martyrdom, slaughter of Catholics. More Catholics have been martyred in the past hundred years than the total from all the previous 19 centuries. Sign. The moral corruption and degradation of our youth. It hardly bears comment. It's already almost beyond belief. Uh, the schools are, are just one of many examples. Just think about the new uh, rainbow curriculum that's mandatory in Catholic public schools. I was on the Texans for Co-Life Coalition website yesterday, and it reports that in Catholic schools in Houston, Galveston, and San Antonio, quote, a new uh, immoral education curriculum aimed at grammar school children has been adopted by the local authorities. In terms that rival the boldness and indecency of Planned Parenthood, explicit material is offered to children as young as five years old. Close quote. And the universities are certainly part of the program as well. The Alliance Defense Fund reports that a student at Georgia Tech who had been mocked, cursed, and threatened with rape and murder for standing up for her faith and conservative views on campus, she was told by one of the deans that, quote, students have been indoctrinated for 18 years of their lives by their parents and their churches, and we only have four years to undo the damage, close quote. Sign. Punishment and persecution for keeping the laws of God. Again, uh, you hardly need the priest to point any of this out. One example, I think it's a sign of things to come, will suffice. Quote, a young Christian photographer was reported to the New Mexico Civil Rights Commission, tried, found guilty, and ordered to pay nearly $7,000 in attorney's fees after she respectfully declined to photograph the commitment ceremony of a certain couple despite the fact that neither these types of utterly immoral marriages nor civil unions are legal in New Mexico, close quote. To say nothing of the fact that uh, these are one of the four sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance. Sign, a wholesale rise in the worship of Bacchus. Remember that the pagan feast of Bacchus, the Bacchanalia, celebrated with drinking, dancing, public spectacles, impurities, all the sins of the flesh. This sort of drunken debauchery, the Bacchanalia, is easy to find. It's just been electrified. This whole culture of rock and roll, nightclubs, MTV, etc. Sign, a push towards a united one-world religion, which, of course, is not the true religion. On that note, the URI, it's the United Religions Initiative, It's founded in 1995 uh, with the goal of making a spiritual equivalent of the United Nations, which is supposed to encompass all religions and all types of spirituality. All types of spirituality. The stated goals of the URI include peace and unity among religions, social justice, preservation of the environment. At the 1997 URI Summit Conference, a public worship service included a procession of 15 banners with symbols representing the world's religion, including a banner for the Wiccans, the neo-pagan witchcraft movement. The 15th banner on it had an empty silver circle representing the religions which are to come. Uh, we shouldn't be alarmed by any of this, but we should pay attention. Sign, false idolatrous worship in Catholic churches, erecting of idols in Catholic churches, and worship being given them. Now, this sort of thing is cropping up uh, more and more often, and not just in the chapels of female religious communities that have lost their way. Of course, everyone here is, uh, I'm sure, is familiar with the astonishing example in Assisi on October 27, 1986, when the Dalai Lama and a group of his Tibetan Buddhist monks placed a statue of the Buddha on top of the tabernacle, and they placed this lotus uh, flower-shaped censer in front of the tabernacle. On the side, one side of the tabernacle, they had this banner with Buddhist I don't know what on it, 
and then two pagan books, uh, two Buddhist books on either side of the tabernacle. And then they bowed down in front of the altar and did some sort of pagan Buddhist ceremony. Now, by the way, if you want to see the actual examples, real examples of the bronze idols that Tibetan Buddhists uh, pray to, there's an absolutely remarkable exhibit of them in the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Uh, If you go to look at them, you must be careful that your children do not look at them. Another example springs to mind. It took place exactly one month ago today in the Basilica of St. Mary the Angel in Assisi on the 25th anniversary of the first meeting there. A Nigerian named Wanda Ombimbla. Now, he's a former Harvard professor, uh, which is fitting, and a current high priest of Yoruba religion. Uh, We should read that witch doctor. This witch doctor took the occasion to lecture the Pope and others present. And here's what the witch doctor had to say, quote, The time has come for leaders of all the world's religions to have a new frame of mind in which indigenous religions are given the same respect and consideration as other religions, close quote. Well, thanks a lot, doctor. This moral advice coming from the high priest of a religion which traditionally not only sacrifices animals, but also humans. Then he took the occasion to shake a rattle and sing some sort of song, hymn, incantation, curse, I don't know, take your choice, in honor of one of the demons he worships, which is supposed, he believes is chained uh, to the bottom of the ocean. Well, he's chained all right, but it's a little deeper than the bottom of the ocean. Anyway, uh, over here, this Yoruba religion, of which this guy is a witch doctor, over here, in the Spanish-speaking parts of the world, it's called Santeria, and in the Portuguese parts of the world, it's Candelombe or Macombe. Uh, Father Gabriel Amorth, he's the retired uh, former chief exorcist in Rome, the most experienced uh, exorcist in the world, uh, points out that the very most difficult cur- curses for an exorcist to break are those that are done through voodoo. Now, voodoo comes, th- this guy's from Nigeria, and right next door where his tribe, the tribe he's from, is Benin, where voodoo, that's, that's from tribes right there in Benin, and the ones that are from voodoo or from Yoruba. Those are the two hardest curses for exorcists to break in the world. And we have guys like this giving us moral advice in Catholic churches. Thanks a lot. What are we to think of this? Let's check with God. Psalm 95, 5, quote, All the gods of the Gentiles are devils. Close quote, God the Holy Ghost. Sign, profanation and stripping of the beauty, sacred vessels, and treasures found in Catholic churches. How many churches have been recovated? Beautiful marble altars smashed. Chalices, monstrances, relics, statues thrown away. Cornelius de Lapide has a most interesting and alarming observation that's worth pondering very carefully. Quote, Morally, the abomination of desolation is sacrilege and heresy, especially iconoclasm. For heresy is an idol abominable to God, which brings around the desolation of kingdoms and peoples and the yoke of the Turk. By the yoke of the Turk, he means invasion of Islam. This is worth repeating. Morally, the abomination of desolation is sacrilege sacrilege and heresy, especially iconoclasm. For heresy is an idol abominable to God, which brings about the destruction of kingdoms and peoples and the yoke of the Turk. For when heretics especially iconoclasts, violate consecrated churches and break the images of the saints and profane the holy places, then it is certain that the desolation and devastation of the people is eminent. God avenges sacrilege in the violation of his divine majesty, worship, and religion. Close quote. When heretics, especially iconoclasts, violate consecrated churches and break the images of the saints and profane the holy places, then it is certain that the devastation and desolation of the people is eminent. God avenges sacrilege in the violation of his divine majesty, worship, and religion.
So if we were heeding our Lord's command to watch, those are a few of the signs we might want to watch for. Popes have already given us a fairly decent idea of where in history we're living. Now what are we supposed to do? We want to remember that God's in charge. He loves us. He knows exactly when in history he wanted each one of us to live. We don't need to imitate Chicken Little. We need, each need to do our duty in our state of life. We need to get serious about the commandments. We need to get serious about our faith. We need to get serious about our personal holiness. Say your rosary and your three Hail Marys and your prayers every day. No exceptions. Wear your brown scapular. Stop sinning. Go to confession every two weeks. Make fervent communions. Spend time before our Lord in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. Put God first and become holy. It's pretty basic. Get serious about your faith. Stay in the state of grace and do your duty. Just do your duty. Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On last Sunday of the liturgical year, the first Sunday of Advent, the Church asked us to consider the end of the world. So we'll do that. As usual, the quotes will be uh, edited and cut and pasted. Before we get into it, let's note that in today's Gospel and elsewhere, our Lord has commanded us to read the signs of the times. Watch ye therefore, because you know not at what hour your Lord will come. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. Blessed is he that watcheth. Now, obviously, this is an exciting topic, but we're not supposed to have a chicken little, the skies flying sort of conniption fit when we, when we think about it. The great Belgian Jesuit, St. John Birchmans, gives us a perfect example of how we ought to act when we think about this very topic. One day during the time assigned for recreation, St. John Birchman and his fellow Jesuit scholastics were shooting pool. And one of them asked him, Hey, John, if you found out the world was going to end right now, what would you do? He kept lining up his shot, and he said, I'd keep right on playing billiards. Now, what's the point? St. John Birchman was supposed to be taking recreation, and he was, and he's supposed to be in the state of grace, and he was. In other words, he was doing just what he was supposed to be doing at that moment. And our Lord expects us to be doing our duty when he comes again. So if we're in a state of grace and we're doing our duty, we're all right. The most important thing is not when in history we live, but how we die. The most important thing is to die in the state of grace. If we die in the state of grace, we're going to be all right. Okay, then we're saved. That's the most important thing, the one thing that matters. All right, so much for an introduction. Let's turn to the topic at hand. Today we're going to consider what we've been told about the state of the world, about the moral climate of the world before the second coming. There's a fascinating passage in the Catechism of the Catholic Church which speaks of that moral climate, the moral climate of the end times. Quote, Before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies our pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Close quote, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. So the Catechism is speaking explicitly of an apostasy from the truth. So prior to penetrating in to the particular pronouncements we find in sacred scripture, let's pause for a moment and consider exactly what it is when we refer to the word truth. It seems like a funny thing to have to talk about, but those are the days we live in. 
truth. There are two common usages for the word truth. Truth commonly refers either to truth and understanding, that is to say, truth in our judgment, which is also known as logical truth, or truth in speech, which is also known as moral truth. So logical truth is truth in judgment, and moral truth is truth in speech. Logical truth means an agreement of a mind with a thing. This is my hand. That's an altar rail. That's a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So truth, when we're talking about logical truth, we're talking about a judgment which agrees with reality, a correspondence between my mind and the thing. Error is a judgment that doesn't agree with reality. For example, I think that's St. Anne. My mind does not correspond to the thing. So much for logical truth. What about moral truth? Moral truth means the agreement of my speech with my mind. In other words, when we say what we think, that's true. When we say what, what, we, when what we say is not what we think, that's false, and everybody knows that's a lie. So logical truth means the agreement of the mind with the thing. Moral truth means the agreement of the speech with the mind. All right. So we're considering what we've been told about the state of the world, about the moral climate of the world before the second coming. And we've seen that the, the catechism says the church must pass through the final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at a price of apostasy from the truth. Let's turn to the scriptures. As we tackle this question today, we're going to see that we've been given a fairly detailed description about the general moral state of the individuals living in the end times, and that scripture is very clear, very specific, as regarding truth and the reaction of men who live in the last days to truth. We'll start by focusing on the state of individuals in the last days, and then we'll pull back to get a more panoramic view of the state of society itself at that terrible time. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and following, quote, But know this, that in the last days dangerous times will come. Men will be lovers of self, covetous, haughty, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, criminal, heartless, faithless, slanders, incontinent, merciless, unkind, treacherous, stubborn, puffed up with pride, loving pleasure more than God, having an appearance indeed of piety, but disowning its power. These men also resist the truth, for they are corrupt in mind, reprobate as regards the faith. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. That's quite a list. If we had the time, we could easily spend an hour just unpacking the implications in in this one scripture. But we'll just touch on a few of the points very quickly. In the last days, men will be puffed up with pride and lovers of self. They'll be faithless to the point of being reprobate, meaning they have so abused grace that as a just punishment, they'll no longer seriously or intelligently care about their eternal salvation. They'll be incontinent, meaning they'll be gluttons and burn with lust, and so not surprisingly, they'll love pleasure more than God. They will have an appearance of piety without the virtue. Cornelius Elapide explains this means they will profess to be Christians, although they will be both very wicked in their works and perverse in their ideas. And because mental integrity is clouded by various lusts and vices, their minds will be corrupted and they'll be resistant to truth. Resistance to truth. In the first chapter of his letter to the Romans, St. Paul discusses his sin and its consequences in some detail. Resisting the truth, excerpts from Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so that's plain enough. Wickedness, uh, in their wickedness, they've rejected the known truth. By sinning against the known truth, their minds have become darkened. 
whenever we sin, our minds are darkened and our wills are weakened. That's scary enough. Now listen to this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonor of their bodies among themselves. Okay, so they've sinned uh, it, by darkening their minds against the light of reason, and as a consequence, God gives them up to impurity. Now that raises a question. What does the scripture mean when it states that God gives them up to impurity? St. John Chrysostom says that in punishment of their will for blindness, their willful rejection of the known truth, God permitted them to fall into the foulest, most shameful and unnatural sins of uncleanness. In other words, as a just punishment for their pride, as a just punishment for their willful blindness and error, God withdraws his grace, and this permits them to fall into those shameful sins. We'll hear about those right now. Back to the scripture. It's edited. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their woman exchanged natural relations for unnatural. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion, committing shameless acts and receiving their own persons the due penalty for their error. Now, we've talked about this before. A people who reject the known truth are doomed to blindness and the worst kinds of perversity. And as we turn back to the scriptures, we'll see that an outbreak of San Francisco behavior isn't the only result of denying the known truth. Listen carefully to this list of sinful, vicious behaviors that sprout up in the wake of denying the known truth. St. Paul. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and improper conduct. They were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, their gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those who practice them. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. So there's a terrifying list of the rotten fruits of resisting the known truth. We'll continue by turning to 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the last times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error and doctrines of devils, speaking lies hypocritically and having their conscience seared. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. Now, that's really interesting. Every day in the last gospel, which is, of course, the beginning of the gospel of St. John, every day in the last gospel, we hear our Lord called the word. In fact, we all genuflect at that phrase, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Okay, now St. John wrote his gospel in Greek. The Greek word that St. John used here is logos. Logos is Greek for word. In other words, we could say the Logos was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So our Lord is the Word, our Lord is the Logos. Logos is the Greek word for word. Okay, so what, Padre? Why would we care that Logos is the Greek word for word and we could call our Lord the Logos? Let's go back through the scripture real quickly and we'll see why. In the last time, some will depart from the faith, word for that, apostasy, giving heeds to spirit of error and doctrines of devils. That's pretty self-explanatory. And last time, some of this part from the faith, giving heed to the spirit of error and doctrines of the devil, speaking lies hypocritically. Speaking lies hypocritically. The Greek word here used for lies is pseudologos. Pseudologos. Pseudo means false. Men who apostatize and follow demons, following, speaking false words hypocritically. Under, in other words, under the pretense they're true. And then if we look at today's gospel in the Greek, we read at the end of the world there will be pseudo-Christs. I'm not going to read the, the Greek part of it. And there's pseudo-prophets. Uh, and the commentary refers you to uh, St. Peter, Second Peter chapter 2, where it talks about the pseudo-teachers, the false Christ, false prophets, false teachers, false words, false Christ, false prophets, false teachers. Okay, so Scripture makes this absolutely remarkable contrast. On the one hand, We have the true teacher, the true prophet, the true word, the true Christ, the true Logos who has made flesh and dwelt amongst us, who speaks only true words and has commissioned men and sent them out, guided by the Holy Spirit to teach only the true gospel. So that's on the one hand. 
And on the other hand, we have the warning from Scripture in the last days about false Christ and false prophets and false teachers performing false signs and false wonders and preaching a false faith with false words, hypocritical false words, doctrines of devils spoken by men that have apostatized who are guided by evil spirits. It's an amazing contrast between truth and falsity. Speaking of the great signs and wonders performed by the false Christ and false prophets, which will seduce many, Cornelius the Lapidate explains that the people will not be seduced, quote, by the strength of the seducers, but by the negligence of those being seduced, close quote. In other words, in those days, if someone is seduced by a false prophet or false teacher, it'll be due to his own negligence. It'll be his own fault. Those who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. Okay, so we've been considering the meaning of this scripture. The Spirit expressly says that in the last time some will depart from the faith, giving heeds to spirit of error and doctrines of devil, speaking lies hypocritically, and having their conscience seared. Let's quickly consider that last clause, having their conscience seared. Cornelius Lapide explains that this phrase, having a seared conscience, should be understood understood as meaning having a moral corruption that is so complete that the person is hardened in its evil ways. And so he has a complete loss of the sense of sin. In other words, he's become a reprobate. That's the worst possible state in this life. We'll continue by turning to 2 Timothy 4, 3 and following. For there will come a time when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap up to themselves teachers according to their own lusts, and they will turn away from hearing the truth and turn aside, rather, to fables. The commentary points out that the hearers will run after novelties and teaching, which favors their passions. Cornelius de Lapide comments, Many men devoted to sensual pleasures will seek teachers similar to themselves, who will lead them away from a sound faith and the discipline of a Christian life, to heretical errors and a licentious life and corrupt morals. These men, full of vain and carnal desires, have itching ears. In other words, they love to hear novel things, curious things, soft and effeminate things, sensual things. These men shall seek for themselves teachers who will not sting them with words or scrape away their vices, but rather teachers who will deceive them into believing what they wish regarding their sins by preaching pleasantries worthy of applause. In other words, they, don't, they won't want to hear the truth because it'll hurt. They don't want to hear the truth because it means they'd have to change their sinful and disordered ways of life and their sinful and disordered ways of thinking. They would rather have teachers affirm them in their sins. They would have, rather have preachers lie to them. They'd rather have preachers tell them myths and pleasantries. They'd rather have teachers tell them what they want to hear than correct their false beliefs and vices and perhaps hurt their feelings. They want teachers that'll tell them things like, how do you know it's wrong unless you've tried it? Your body, your choice. Don't worry. God made you that way. You can follow your appetites as long as no one gets hurt. The sin of Sodom was just a lack of hospitality. Well, yes, there is a hell, but no one goes there. You don't really think a loving God would actually send anyone there, do you? Don't be so dogmatic. There are many paths to heaven. It's not a sin. No one takes humana vitae seriously. You're just being responsible. It's sinful to be in union with a conciliar church. Okay, we've taken a quick look at a few scriptures which speak of the moral state of men in the last days. What have we seen? We've seen that in those days the men will be puffed up with pride and self-love. They'll love pleasure more than God. They'll profess to be Christian, but they'll be both very wicked in their works and perverse in their ideas. They'll be resistant to the truth. We've seen that this rejection of the known truth dooms a people to blindness and the worst kind of sins and perversity. We've considered detailed lists of those sins. And we've seen that Scripture explicitly teaches that although such people know that those who do these kind of wicked things deserve to die, nonetheless they not only do them, but approve others who are practicing them. 
We've seen in the last times there will be false Christs and false prophets and false teachers performing false signs and false wonders and preaching a false faith with false words, hypocritical false words, doctrines of devils spoken by men who have apostatized and are guided by evil spirits, and that those who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. We've seen that men won't want to hurt the, hear the truth because it'll hurt. It means they'll have to change their sinful and disordered ways of life and their ways of thinking. We've seen they'd rather have teachers affirm them in their sins and lie to them than correct their false beliefs and their vices and hurt their feelings. And we've seen that resistance to the truth results in a moral corruption so complete that a man becomes hardened his evil ways and suffers the complete loss of a sense of sin, which is commonly known as being a reprobate. So if we're going to summarize what we've seen thus far, the last times we characterized by a social atmosphere that's absolutely basted in lies and deception, filled with people that are deliberately and obstinately resistant to the truth and therefore live with darkened minds and depraved morals. We're getting a clear picture of what the catechism means when it states the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from truth. Now we're going to take a more panoramic view of the moral atmosphere. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, we read, quote, Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Here we see that Scripture explicitly teaches the day of the Lord, judgment day, the end of the world, can't come unless there first be an apostasy, a great falling away from the true faith, a great revolt against the true faith. And then in the wake of that apostasy, in the midst of it, the great apostasy, the man of sin, sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, will be revealed. Blessed John Henry Newman, summarizing the teaching of the fathers on this point, states the fierce in lawless principle, which historically is repressed by the governing powers, will finally break completely loose in those terrible times, spawning heresy, schism, sedition, revolution, and war. And he states that, quote, the coming of Christ will be immediately preceded by a very awful and unparalleled outbreak of evil, called by St. Paul an apostasy, a falling away, in the midst of which a certain terrible man of sin and child of perdition, the special and singular enemy of Christ, Antichrist, will appear. That this will be when revolutions prevail and the present framework of society breaks to pieces. Close quote. So there will be an absolutely terrible, unprecedented outbreak of evil during which society will be torn into pieces by apostasy, heresy, schism, sedition, revolutions, and war. Now, before we go any farther, we'll pause briefly to make sure we all understand which each, what each of those terms mean. Apostasy. Apostasy means a baptized person completely rejects Christianity whole and entire, chucks it overboard, and either embraces a non-Christian religion, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Satanism, or has no religion whatsoever. That's a mortal sin against the faith. An apostate loses the faith, and God is under absolutely no obligation to give it back to him. Cornelius Elapidi, there's no surer sign of reprobation than anyone should apostatize from the faith. Heresy. Heresy means a baptized person pertinaciously denies or doubts any revealed truth of the Catholic faith. In other words, he stubbornly denies the revealed truth even when he has been shown to be wrong. Nowadays, heretics are often called dissenters. Cornelius Lapide. Heresy is Greek for choosing. A heretic, therefore, is one who chooses what he will believe, and therefore does not believe those things which must be believed according to the teachings of the doctors in the church. So this is also mortal sin against the faith. A heretic loses the faith. And again, God is under absolutely no obligation to give it back to him. Schism. Schism occurs when either a group or even an individual, while preserving the true faith, nevertheless voluntarily, knowingly, and deliberately separates himself from the unity of the church, 
either by refusing to submit to the authority of the Pope and or to remain in communion with those who are subject to him. Schism has been called the crystallization of orthodox dissent. Cornelius Lapide, schism is a grave and savage sin because of the wrong done to Christ. St. Cyprian and St. Jerome teach that schismatics are worse than the men who crucified Christ because his seamless garment, namely the church, is torn and separated, which not even the Jews and Gentiles who crucified Christ dared to do. Unlike apostasy and heresy, pure schism is not a sin against the faith because a schismatic individual group has maintained the faith. What they've done is cut themselves off from the vine. Over time, schism typically creates in this heresy because it becomes necessary to deny the primacy of the Pope. But as such, schism is a mortal sin against charity. Sedition. Sedition is the crime of stirring up a revolt, disturbance, or violence against lawful civil authority with the intent to cause its overthrow or destruction. Sedition has to do with organizing and encouraging opposition to government rather than directly participating in its overthrow. It's a mortal sin against peace. Revolution. Revolution is the usually violent attempt by many people to end the rule of one government and start a new one. So that's the big picture. In the terms of the moral climate of society in the end times, at the time of the great apostasy, this great rebellion, there will be a terrible, unprecedented outbreak of evil. Society will be racked by apostasy, heresy, schism, sedition, revolutions, war, and societal breakdown. We'll turn back to scripture. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and following. And his coming, we're speaking the coming of the Antichrist, and his coming is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all wicked deception to those who are perishing. For they have not received the love of truth that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error, that they might believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness. But we, brethren, beloved of God, are bound to give thanks to God always for you, because God has chosen you as first fruits and a salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. Now this is very, very interesting. In the midst of this chaos, in the midst of the societal breakdown and great apostasy, the Antichrist will appear with satanic power and satanic signs and lying wonders, the Greek here has pseudo-miracles, and with all wicked deception. We've already seen that with the other false prophets and other false Christs. But what's really important is notice who is going to be deceived. The scriptures are absolutely clear. As I read this passage again, pay close attention to exactly who is going to be deceived by the Antichrist. Quote, Those who are perishing have received not the love of truth that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error that they might believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness. Close quote. So who exactly is going to be deceived? Men that don't want to hear the truth because it will hurt, because it means they're going to have to swallow their pride and change their sinful and disordered ways of life and their sinful and disordered ways of thinking. Men who would rather have their leaders affirm them in their sins and lie to them than correct their false beliefs and vices and perhaps have their feelings hurt. Men who do not love the truth and refuse to receive it. Men who would rather believe false words from false teachers than believe the true words from the true word of God. And the men who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. Since they don't love the truth, God will permit them to have what they do want and what they do love, which is the lie. What does it mean to say that God will send them the operation of error that they may believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth but have preferred wickedness? The Haydock commentary explains that this means that God shall allow them to be deceived by lying wonders and false miracles as a punishment of their not loving the truth. In other words, when it says that God will send them the operation of error, it doesn't mean he will cause them to believe the lies. After all, God desires the salvation of all men, and it would be heretical to deny that. God does, it doesn't mean, in other words, that God will cause them to believe the lies, but rather that it is a just punishment for the rejection of the known truth as a just punishment 
for their willful and stubborn blindness and error, he's going to withdraw his grace. And the result of him withdrawing this grace will permit them to be deceived by the Antichrist. It's very sobering. When it says that the reason this will happen is, quote, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness, close quote, the Greek here, word used here for judge means to be judged, condemned, and punished. And why? For refusing to believe the truth. Those who don't want to follow Christ, those who don't want to believe the, believing his, the teaching of his church, those who want to live the way they want to live, will believe the lie, and they'll follow the Antichrist. It's that simple. We're also told who's not going to be deceived. Verse 12. But we, brethren, beloved of God, are bound to give thanks to God always for you, because God has chosen you as first fruits unto salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief for the truth. The operation of error and the marvels and seduction of the Antichrist will not deceive those who love and believe in the truth. In May of 1897, Pope Leo XIII stated in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, quote, Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God. But he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. Close quote. He who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. We're all familiar with that terrifying statement of our Lord. We can find it in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 29. He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, he shall never have forgiveness, but shall be guilty of an everlasting sin. Those are the words of truth himself. Resisting the truth is one of the sins against the Holy Ghost. And I quote from a standard Catholic reference work. In particular, deliberate resistance to the known truth may be regarded as specially directed against the work of the Holy Ghost in the soul. Generally, this so hardens the soul to the inspirations of grace that repentance is unlikely. Close quote. Back to Leo XIII. Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God, but he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. In our days, this sin has become so frequent. He's writing in 1897. In our days, this sin has become so frequent that those dark times seem to have come, which were foretold by St. Paul, in which men, blinded by the just judgment of God, should take falsehood for truth and should believe in the prince of this world, who is a liar and the father thereof, as a teacher of truth. As it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and 1 Timothy 4.1, God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying. In the last time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error and the doctrines of devils. Close quote, the vicar of Christ. Well, you're in very good company if you've been thinking that we may very well be living in these terrible times. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. I don't want to hear it. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. My mind is made up. I'm not going to change my ways. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. I'd rather keep my options open. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. I don't want to be extreme. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. It's not that black and white. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. People might think I'm some kind of fundamentalist. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. It can't be that bad. Everybody's doing it. Today, today, and don't put this off, before you leave, and throughout the day, take the time to seriously search your mind and your heart. Ask yourself, 
Am I open to the truth? Am I a truth seeker? Or am I resistant to the truth? It's one of the most important questions you can ever ask yourself. Ask yourself, if the Antichrist appeared this week, whose camp would I be in? If the Antichrist appears during my lifetime, whose camp will I be in? He who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. The church must pass through a final trial in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Ave Maria Purissima. Uh, We're not going to cite every source since it's not an academic exercise. As usual, the quotes will be cut, pasted, and edited. Okay, last week, we considered what we've been told about the state of the world, about the moral condition of the world before the second coming. We saw in the last days, although the men shall both be very wicked in their works and perverse in their ideas, loving pleasure more than God, they will still profess to be Christians. We saw in the last times there will be an absolutely terrible, unprecedented outbreak of evil, during which time society will be torn to pieces by apostasy, heresy, schism, sedition, revolution, and war. We've seen that in the midst of all this chaos, the Antichrist will appear. And the men who have been resistant to the truth, who don't want to hear the truth because it hurts, because it means they have to change their sinful and disordered ways of living and thinking, men who want to live the way they want to live, these men, the vast majority of men, will believe the lie and be deceived by the Antichrist and follow him. As a just punishment for the rejection of the known truth, they'll fall under the operation of error, and God will permit them to have what they do want and what they do love, which is the lie. We saw the operation of error and the marvels and seduction of the Antichrist will not deceive a small remnant of those who love and believe in the truth. Okay, so much for the review. So given the papal warnings, and since the time of Leo XIII, most of the popes have given a warning, and given the spectacular state of society and utter chaos within the church, today, as a working hypothesis, we're going to assume we're in the great apostasy or else we're in the dress rehearsal. And should the Antichrist appear during our lifetime, we want to make absolutely sure that we're not going to be swept away by the operation of error. Obviously, the marvels and seduction of the Antichrist will not deceive those who love and believe in the truth. And since that's the case, we each need to have a single heart in pursuit of the truth, wherever it leads and however painful it might be. Let's start by drawing some insights today from a man who, after having been locked in blindness and sinful behavior, who, after having been resistant to the truth himself, after not wanting to change his sinful and disordered way of living and thinking, who, after wanting to live the way he wanted to live, who, after all that, converted, that man is a great doctor of the church, St. Augustine. Listen carefully. St. Augustine's problem for his conversion was not only that he was steeped in sin, it was that his mind defended his commission of sin. Therefore, in order to return to God, he had first to be convinced that he was a sinner. To return to God, Augustine had to overcome two vices, the habit of wrong thinking and the habit of wrong doing. Yet both habits had a stronghold on his proud and passionate nature. In order to justify his misconduct, Augustine had become a Manichaean. This was the convenient heresy of claiming there were two gods. The evil god was responsible for all the evil we do, 
and the good God is the only cause of everything good in our lives. On these premises, Augustine could attribute his life of sin to the evil deity and not feel guilty for all the wrongdoing in his life. St. Augustine dates his conversion to the discovery he made that he had a free will. Once it dawned on him that he had the power to control his mind and what to think, and the power to control his will and what to choose, he was back on his way to service to God. On this level of teaching, Augustine is a prophet for our times. There is so much learned justification of sin that whole philosophies have been created to defend man's misconduct by shifting the blame on heredity or environment or education. Anything and anyone that human ingenuity can devise is said to be responsible for the evils in the world today, except the real agent of evil, which is man's free will in refusing to submit to the demanding will of God. Close quotes, Father John Harden. This is really important, so let's pause for a minute and reflect on it. St. Augustine was sinning, and he was proud. And the pride was by far and away the greater danger. Why is that? Because when a man is proud, it's very, very difficult for him to admit it's wrong. And so as we've seen, he found a convenient way of excusing his sin. The evil God is making me do it. We see this sort of thing all the time. I was born this way. My parents didn't treat me right. You don't expect me to act like a monk or something. I grew up in a bad neighborhood, and on and on and on it goes. We need to pray for the humility to embrace the truth, no matter how painful, for the humility to take responsibility for our own actions, for the humility to admit it when we're acting wrongly or thinking wrongly. St. Augustine is a prophet for our times, and he has a lot to teach us. Dr. E. Michael Jones has drawn some important observations from the teaching of St. Augustine. I quote, St. Augustine divides the world up into two camps, the city of God and the city of man. The men in the city of God love God to the exclusion of self. The men in the city of man love self to the exclusion of God. Love of God, St. Augustine makes clear, is intimately bound up with the truth. St. Augustine, quote, When a man lives according to truth, he lives not according to himself, but according to God. For it was God who said, I am the truth. Close quote. Okay, so St. Augustine teaches there's two kinds of men that we can find in the world. St. Augustine, we distribute the human race into two kinds of men, one living according to man, the other living according to God. Mystically, we call them two cities or two societies of men, thus St. Augustine. And it's very important. St. Augustine explains that the way that the men in each of these two societies use their wills is what produces these two camps or these two cities, if you will. It all depends on whom they love and how deep they love, what they are willing to pay is the price of their love. St. Augustine. These two cities are made by two loves. The earthly city, by love of oneself, even to the contempt of God. The heavenly city, by love of God, even to the contempt of self. The one glories in itself. The other glories in God. The one seeks glory from men, to the other, God, witness of conscience, is its glory. Close quotes, St. Augustine. So it's an immense help to realize that part of God's mysterious providence is the fact that there are two kinds of people in the world at any given point in history. Those who abuse their free will and refuse to surrender to the loving will of God, who glory in themselves and seek glory from men, and those who want to give the glory to God, who use their freedom for its noblest purpose to sacrifice everything they have, including themselves, to the loving will of God. Back to Dr. Jones. St. Augustine makes it clear that the love of God is intimately bound up with truth. When a man lives according to the truth, 
He lives not according to himself, but according to God. For it was God who said, I am the truth. Conversely, when a man does not live according to the truth, he lives according to himself and not according to God. Close quote. Okay, so that's another way of understanding this fearful symmetry that's found right in the very fabric of reality itself. The city of God is composed of the men who live according to truth, and the city of man is composed of men who live according to themselves. Now Dr. Jones applies these truths. Religious leaders who suppress the truth can only think, therefore, that something in this life is more important than God. We all know what those things are. Money, sex, esteem in the eyes of men, political power, things which are good in themselves, which are evil when used as a substitute for the highest good. In the name of serving God, they end up serving an idol. And idol worship, as the Bible makes clear, always involves punishment of those who will not serve. Idols symbolize the exaltation of appetite over truth. Close quote. When a man does not live according to the truth, he lives according to himself, and not according to God, he serves an idol. And serving an idol, be it money, sex, esteem in the eyes of others, political power, religious power, serving an idol instead of serving the living God always involves serving a devil who stands behind that idol, always. There are no exceptions. That is reality. Back to Dr. Jones. Certain religious leaders do not proclaim the truth as a service to the people who follow them. They suppress the truth as a service to themselves. They also do it to keep their followers in the dark as a way of consolidating power over their followers. These leaders are to the priests of the Lord God what Dracula is to Jesus. Jesus shed his blood so that we might have eternal life. Dracula sheds our blood so that he might have eternal life at our expense. Some religious leaders do not proclaim the truth as a service to the people, They suppress the truth as a service to themselves. They also do it to keep their followers in the dark as a way of consolidating their power over their followers. Okay, so what have we seen so far? We've seen that St. Augustine divides the world up into two camps, the city of God and the city of man. The men in the city of God love God even to the contempt of themselves. The men in the city of man love themselves even to the contempt of God. We've seen that the love of God is intimately bound up with the truth, and so the city of God is composed of the men who live according to truth. And the city of man is composed of the men who live according to themselves. We've seen that when a man lives according to himself and not according to truth, then he serves an idol. We've seen that serving an idol, whatever it might be, instead of living God, always involves serving a devil who is standing behind that idol. We've seen that some religious leaders do not proclaim the truth as a service to the people who follow them. They suppress the truth as a service to themselves. They also do it to keep their followers in the dark as a way of consolidating power over their followers. So if we're going to sum up what we've seen, we've seen that how we respond to truth is the key to our salvation. If we embrace the truth, if we submit ourselves, our intellects, and our desires in service to the truth will be in the city of God and ultimately be saved. It's that simple. But if we reject or resist the truth, if we live according to our desires and not according to the truth, then we'll be in the city of man, and should we die in that condition, we'll be damned. It's also that simple. Truth himself told 